Good afternoon. It's Saturday, August 1st here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. And on your screen is a live view of the interior of the Dragon spacecraft as we await its departure from the International Space Station. Now we expect Dragon to push away from the space station with NASA astronauts Bob Benkin, who's actually in the frame right now, and Doug Hurley on board just after 4.35 p.m. Pacific time to make their way back home to planet Earth. My name is Shiva Bharadvaj, and I'm a space operations engineer here at SpaceX, and I'm really excited to be bringing you live coverage today of Crew Dragon as it completes its very first trip to space with people on board as part of our second demonstration mission for NASA. And joining me today is NASA Public Affairs Officer, Leah Cheshire. Thanks for having me, Shiva. It really is great to be back here for this historic milestone moment in NASA's commercial crew program. Once Dragon departs station, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley's flight home is expected to last roughly 19 hours. That'll include four departure burns that move Dragon away from station, a phasing burn to lower its orbit and line the spacecraft up with its landing location, and one final deorbit burn. Their trip home will also include an eight-hour sleep period later tonight, where both crew members will be able to get some rest before their arrival back on Earth tomorrow after a little more than two months in space. Dragon is targeted to splash down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida in the Gulf of Mexico tomorrow at 11.48 a.m. Pacific time, followed by the crew getting picked up at sea by one of SpaceX's recovery vessels. Now, the mission began about two months ago on May 30th from historic launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And after a successful separation from the Falcon 9, Bob and Doug enjoyed a 19-hour flight on board Dragon before they came to the International Space Station. Now, since arriving, Bob and Doug have been doing some real work aboard the station. In fact, Bob and Station Commander Chris Cassidy completed several spacewalks, and they've also been taking some really spectacular photos of planet Earth and the Dragon spacecraft as it's been in attached operations. We'll uh, have a chance to share some of those later on in the broadcast. And I can't believe it, but it's already been 63 days since they arrived in space. So they are just entering the final phase of their mission in just a few hours from now and have been preparing for over the last two weeks for their return flight. Today on board the space station is the Expedition 63 crew, led by NASA's Chris Cassidy and joined by Russian cosmonauts Anatoly Ivanishin and Ivan Wagner. And of course, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. Now, while all the crew have been busy aboard, the ground teams have also been performing a number of checkouts in preparation for departure today. Um, these checkouts have been going on over the last several days and, in fact, last week. Um, they've included inspections of the heat shield, checkouts of the suits, some checkouts of the comm systems, as well as a number of activation procedures on the life support system on the vehicle um, and cargo loading, which has been really cool. Um, actually, why don't we take a, or why don't we check in with Gary at Johnson Space Center? He can let us know how the station crew have been preparing and uh, what we can expect from here. Gary? Thank you, Shiva and Leah, and welcome inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Since arriving at the space station, Bob and Doug jumped right in as fully-fledged members of Expedition 63. Over the last two months, they've helped execute more than two dozen scientific investigations from every major category of research aboard the station, including studies in biology and biotechnology, earth and space sciences, human research, physical sciences, and technology demonstration. They've also had plenty of non science-related work on their timelines, performing maintenance on life support and vehicle hardware in multiple modules, and transferring cargo in and out of the attached HTV-9 cargo spacecraft. Bob Benkin also executed four spacewalks with Station Commander Chris Cassidy, wrapping up one of the final phases of upgrading the station's large external batteries, with Doug assisting in all suit and robotic operations. Since completing the spacewalks, Bob and Doug have spent the last two weeks preparing to come home. They received some additional on-orbit training to refresh them on the departure, re-entry, and splashdown procedures, and have been busy packing cargo for their return. In fact, that's what they're doing right now. There will be approximately 150 kilograms, or 330 pounds, of cargo returning on Dragon. The majority of that is more than 200 pounds of science, largely made up of samples packed away into powered cold freezers. These samples are from a range of biological research experiments on the station dedicated to improving our understanding of how the human body adapts to microgravity or looking at ways to use space to improve life back here on Earth. Now, let's go through some of the 
major upcoming milestones for today's departure coming up soon at uh, just around 2.35 p.m. Pacific. We're currently awaiting Bob and Doug to ingress or board the station uh, or board the Dragon uh, for their return flight home. They're doing a little bit of closeout duties now, uh, but that'll be one of the first items on their agenda today. So less than 30 minutes from now, they'll be closing Dragon's Hatch uh, around 2.45 p.m. Pacific time. Once inside the vehicle, Bob and Doug will don their SpaceX spacesuits, which will be worn during all dynamic phases of the flight. All those same leak checks on the spacecraft would occur uh, before the crew makes their way into the seats and straps in for undocking. Once the Dragon's Hatch is closed, Chris Cassidy will affix a docking target to the outside of the APAS hatch and then close it about 10 minutes later to 55 p.m. Pacific, creating a space between the Dragon and station known as the vestibule. He then has one more hatch to close. That's the node two forward hatch. Now, after all of those hatches are closed, about 15 minutes later, a ground command will be sent to open the valves on the Dragon side and begin depressurization. That's at 3.10 p.m. Pacific, essentially venting air inside and bringing that space down close to vacuum. They have to pause for five at five PSI for a few minutes, allowing the temperature inside that vestibule to stabilize, perform a good leak check, and then continue depressurization. 4.20 p.m. Central Time, they'll conduct a go, no, go poll. That'll be the NASA teams here in Mission Control Houston and SpaceX teams in Hawthorne. If all is go, the undocking sequence begins. The undocking command will be sent, followed by a few minutes for the umbilical that connects the power and data between the two spacecraft to detach. 12 hooks uh, will retract, and then two firings of Dragon's thrusters will initiate, and the undocking will be complete. That uh, separation scheduled for 4.34 uh, p.m. Pacific time. Now the departure burn, there's four departure burns. Immediately after those two uh, burns, they'll actually have that physical separation, uh, and the, the departure burns will take them around the zenith side of the International Space Station. Those uh, departure burns taking place, uh, there's four of them, and will be taking place over the first few hours of their flight, essentially getting that Dragon uh, further away from the International Space Station. Now, uh, overnight, uh, the uh, crew will be able to uh, get a sleep period in. In fact, this uh, orbital trajectory gives them plenty of time to allow for the, the crew sleep to get them in a good circadian rhythm and allow them to uh, perform all of their tasks prior to uh, splashdown. Uh, including, uh, wh while they are asleep, they're going to also be performing a phase burn. And right now, they're in the orbital plane of the International Space Station, but that phase burn will align them with their primary landing site. Uh, right now, we look, we're look. we looking go for uh, Pensacola, just off the uh, coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, they'll perform a series of uh, checks right upon waking up, up when that uh, phase burn occurs while they are asleep. Those checks, they'll put on their suits and get ready for the deorbit sequence. Uh, the deorbit sequence is, uh, there's a few steps there. First, there's going to be the preparation for the claw separation. There's a uh, dragon's trunk. Dragon's They're going to perform a heavy yaw of the Dragon vehicle and release the uh, Dragon trunk off to the side so it doesn't intersect with the vehicle during the deorbit sequence, align uh, Dragon back up uh, with okay, the orbital plane, and fire the uh, uh, forward bulkhead Dracos. This will be one of the longest burns, and that is the deorbit burn, almost more than, actually, 11 minutes long. And that will okay, slow ahead, them down enough. They'll position uh, Dragon yeah, for re-entry into forward Earth's forward atmosphere, forward and then uh, re the re entry sequence will begin. Of course, before they do that, they do have to close the nose cone. So after they close the nose cone, uh, they'll go through the atmosphere, uh, shoot the uh, drogue parachutes, main parachutes, and then splash down. That's scheduled for tomorrow afternoon, Sunday afternoon, uh, around 1.48 uh, p.m. Central Time, 11.48 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time. Then the recovery operations begin after that. Bob and Doug will be back on planet Earth. Now, Station Commander Chris Cassidy will be watching the undocking and departure burn uh, from the cupola, but the prime monitoring role falls to Bob and Doug. Flight controllers in Mission Control Houston will be backing them up. Now, as you've heard several times, Dragon's flight is intended and to be Space autonomous, Dragon, but the crew on board has the ability to take control and, and maneuver Dragon during the departure if necessary. On the station side, we're looking good. Solar arrays are locked in place. We have good communication links, and all reset? station systems are looking healthy. Negative. Attitude will remain on U.S. control until the time of undocking when we'll switch to control okay. moment two gyros only. Three, We're tracking no party, issues for an on-time departure here in Mission Control Houston. Now back to Shiva and Leah in Hawthorne.
Good copy. And finally... So uh, right now on your screen is a view of mission control. Um, that's actually where the ground controllers are all operating. Um, and uh, actually, why don't we listen into the nets for a second? I think there's some chatter happening there. Copy. Thanks. We're going to start 2.103, assuming we have a go. You are go. I believe I just heard a go call on the FD net, but I think we're still in the in the process uh, of assessing vehicle health and actually making sure that Bob and Doug can ingress the capsule, which should be underway currently. So with Dragon's ingress operations now underway, we're about 10 minutes to hatch closure and about two hours until Dragon departs the International Space Station at 4.34 p.m. Pacific time. So next up for Bob and Doug, they need to get in their spacesuits. Yeah, and actually the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the case of a cabin depressurization. Uh, if that were to occur, then the, the suits actually inflate with either nitro a combination of nitrogen and oxygen or oxygen depending on the pressure in the cabin. Uh, and they give them a habitable, habitable environment uh, long enough to get home safely uh, in an emergency scenario. The external portion of the suit is also flame retardant as well. So if there were a fire on board uh, the vehicle, the suits would help provide the crew some protection uh, in that event. Um, the, the suits are actually really cool. They're very aesthetically uh, designed and actually designed in-house here at SpaceX. Yeah, they're definitely very sleek. The crew has actually been really busy all day as they uh, have been preparing to leave. Uh, got up this morning. It's actually evening on the International Space Station right now. And um, they got up and started working out. All the astronauts on the space station have to work out for two hours a day every day to make sure that they keep up their bone strength and their muscle strength so that way they uh, can walk when they get back home. And so uh, they... They got up, got the opportunity to do that. Um, Bob Bankin transferred some emergency equipment from Dragon into the space station. They keep that emergency equipment in there just in case they ever needed to make a quick, speedy getaway in Dragon um, or take a safe haven in that space in case something were to happen in the International Space Station. Yeah, and Leah, you, you mentioned the idea of safe haven. Actually, a couple of the, the visiting vehicles, um, either the Soyuz vehicle and the Dragon vehicle, when they're attached to the space station, can provide the crew with a, a place to to, to hold up if there were an emergency on the station or if there was a, a leak or a fire or depressurization event. And so some of that emergency equipment is stored in the vehicle for quick access in case they needed to get inside very quickly. And the crew actually train uh, pretty, pretty rigorously on those emergency scenarios, getting in quickly under all kinds of visibility scenarios and checking that their crewmates are safely aboard in their vehicles as well. Um, we had a chance to do some training with the crew actually here in Hawthorne uh, early for the Crew 1 crew earlier um, this this month. So, and uh, just a quick recap of kind of what's coming up next. So um, Bob and Doug uh, going through the ingress operations right now. Um, coming up, planned about 2.35 p.m. Pacific time is hatch closure. So that's what we'll, where we will close the forward hatch on the Dragon spacecraft. And then following that will be closure of the APAS hatch. And after we close the APAS hatch there, that's on the space station side. Um, we'll have the space station crew be working on that. Uh, we'll go for vestibule depressurization. And the vestibule is that space in between the hatches uh, that the crew flies through when they arrive and then, of course, when they leave. Uh, but we are going to bring that, that space, which is the same pressurization as the rest of the space station, down to as close to a vacuum as possible uh, because that's what it will be exposed to once uh, Crew Dragon departs, hopefully in just a couple of hours. Yeah. Um, right now, they plan departure and separation uh, is looking like around 4.34 uh, or 4.35 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, and that's when we're, we're hoping to see Dragon do some small undocking burns that will separate it from the, the space station. Uh, on your screen is actually a view from inside the space station uh, looking down node two towards the pressurized mating adapter. Um, I think I saw Chris Cassidy in the view there. Uh, and I think those are his other expedition crewmates on board. Yes. And Bob and Doug probably inside the capsule at this point? Yes, that uh, looks to be Chris Cassidy over on the left, and then Anatoly Ivanishin and Ivan Wagner um, hey, upside down, Ohio or what feels like upside down to us, but really, there's no up or down in space. That's got to be nice. Um, and, yeah, I know, right? And uh, <laughs> both the hatches still open, so we'll be waiting for that hatch closure. 
Yeah, and actually, I think you can see um, that's probably the APAS hatch. If you look just past where all the ISS crew are, uh, I believe that's the APAS hatch that's sort of coming up, kind of that white circle. And uh, Chris Cassidy will actually have some tasks to attach uh, a docking target uh, onto that when we're ready to close the APAS hatch. Looks like he might be hopping into Dragon to uh, help out with some work uh, inside the capsule for securing. Now, we mentioned earlier today, Bob and Doug have been busy today. Um, they've actually been busy as well uh, stowing cargo on board the, uh, the vehicle. Um, just listening into the nets right now, it looks like they're actually going through life support activation. So I just heard a call out uh, that uh, carbon dioxide levels are coming down, which means that our life support system is actively taking in uh, air from the cabin and revitalizing it so Bob and Doug can breathe uh, nicely on board. So just some statistics uh, while we're, we're thinking about it. Um, obviously, we mentioned that Crew Dragon has been on board the station for 63 days now. Feels like yesterday. And during that time, uh, Bob and Doug have traveled 27, over 27 million statute miles around the Earth. So that's incredible. Frequent flyers, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Do you get a, is there a frequent flyer pass for, for Dragon? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're they're zipping around. Um, I, I think on I think on ground track they're going about seventeen thousand five hundred kilometers when they're at ISS's uh, orbital altitude. If, yeah, uh, that that sounds about right. Yeah, <laughs> seven, I think it's seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. I'm sorry, miles so per hour. Thank it's, you. It's it's still extremely fast. So if you look just above the hatch, you see that ISS-20 flag. Uh, that is representing the 20th anniversary of the International Space Station, which we will actually be celebrating later this year. Uh, so for the past 20 years, I, I like to explain it to people as if you are under 20 years of age, you've never lived a day without humans in space. So for the past 20 years, we've had continuous human presence aboard the International Space Station. It's truly international. We have um, obviously our two upside down friends we see, they're getting a better look inside uh, by, by turning in that direction. Uh, they are from Roscosmos, the Russian space agency. Looks like they are taking out the inner module ventilation. Uh, that helps equalize the air in between Dragon's capsule and the rest of the International Space Station. Yeah, that's right. Actually, while Dragon has been attached to the space station, most of its operations have been in what we call quiescent mode. So that's really just a low power state where we've only got monitoring on the thermal system, the propellant system, taking a look at some parameters uh, in case we were to see anything that would trigger uh, the Dragon's onboard automation to wake the vehicle up and let ground operators know something needs to be addressed. Um, the light, the onboard life support system is actually only used when we close the hatches uh, and for brief periods when we are configuring the vehicle when we first arrive and uh, periods when we're leaving, like right now. So that duct that they pull out, the, the intermodule ventilation duct, um, that actually provides clean, breathable air and circulates the air in the, in the capsules uh, and providing that air from the International Space Station. And it looks like hatch closure is soon to be underway. Houston and Hawthorne from Endeavor. Still We're working closing to take the out hatch. some uh, equipment inside, drag and move it back into the space station. Yeah, so as part of those activities, uh, moving the intermodule ventilation duct, uh, they activated, of course, the lithium hydroxide uh, scrubbers on board Dragon. Cabin fan has been running. And uh, I think we're just waiting on confirmation of hatch closure. Yes, and I think they just called down that they are working on that, putting that into motion. We're getting one step closer to sending Bob and Doug home. For Endeavor. SpaceX copies. And Houston copies. And we just got confirmation that uh, Capsule Endeavor has closed the forward hatch. We can actually see on our screen uh, the activities to close the APAS hatch as well. 
and that Crew Dragon hatch closure came at 2.36 p.m. Pacific time as the International Space Station was flying over the North Atlantic Ocean. As, as part of hatch closure operations, Bob and Doug actually inspected the seal on the interior surface of the of the uh, forward hatch on Dragon. And, and we're talking about the forward hatch and the side hatch. The forward hatch is actually uh, the part that's attached to the, the front, uh, sort of the front portion of the International Space Station. So if you imagine the International Space Station flying in a direction around the Earth, the forward direction of it is what we're attached to. Uh, and that, if you are imagining the capsule sitting on the rocket, is actually at the very top of the rocket underneath the nose cone. So uh, if you're imagining the rocket as it was on the launch pad, it's a little bit sideways um, right now. And there's a ceiling surface uh, on that forward hatch that Bob and Doug would have done an inspection on just to make sure that there's no foreign object debris or, or FOD that could cause a potential leak. And looks like we may be stepping into a satellite handover. It happens commonly on the International Space Station, and uh, it's called actually a TDRS handover, tracking data and relay satellite system. We're constantly moving from one to the next. Yeah, so we actually use those tracking and data relay satellites as well on the Dragon vehicle. They provide our telemetry links. Um, there's a, I believe they're in the geo belt. If I, hopefully that's correct. <laughs> but uh, they provide communications, uh, uplink and downlink and commanding, actually, a, a downlink for us to command a, the vehicle as well if we need to step in on the ground side. Uh, speaking of which, we actually have a view of mission controls in Hawthorne. So that is the, uh, that's where our mission controllers are in Hawthorne. Uh, the, the folks who are issuing commands to the Dragon spacecraft are all sitting. Um, in the, the third row there is the, the mission director, as well as, uh, and here's an internal view of the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, we've got uh, Bob in his, uh, looks like his comfort garment, which would be what he wears underneath his suit. Nice to see the uh, capsule getting all packed up. And then another view from the International Space Station side of things. Looks like Anatoly Ivanishin flying out of view and Chris Cassidy down there in between the hatches in that vestibule area. He is working through procedures to uh, soon be closing the A-pass hatch on the space station side and prepare for uh, depressurization. Dragon SpaceX, no response. Yeah, so we, we talked about this a little bit. On cameras for your suit donning. Happy SpaceX, thank you. Now we. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, the vestibule, the, the space between the APAS hatch and the Ford hatch on Dragon is, is really just a, a small volume that is normally exposed to the vacuum of space when we don't have a visiting vehicle, vehicle like the Dragon spacecraft. And uh, we have to step through some uh, depressurization steps once we have confirmed that all of those hatches are uh, secured, both on the International Space Station side as well as on the Dragon side of the spacecraft. So we just heard the call that uh, Bob and Doug are go for suit donning. So the Dragon hatch is closed. They've said farewell to their orbiting friends for now until they're all reunited in the ground in the future. And uh, they'll be going through that suit donning shortly. You did mention it looked like Bob Benkin was already in his comfort garment, that first layer of the suit. Yeah, uh, the comfort garment is, uh, it's, it's basically like an athletic garment. Um, just helps them stay comfortable before they step into the suit. And the, the suit is largely a, a one-piece design. So the helmet is integrated into it. The boots are integrated into it. Um, the, uh, really, they will unzip some, some uh, interfaces on the suit, climb into it, zip all those attachment points up. And then there's actually an umbilical on uh, the leg of the suit. So it's a kind of a connection that provides gases and uh, electrical connections to the suit. So they can use the integrated microphones in their helmets. Uh, and it will also provides them uh, breathable gases for uh, suit leak checks. And if we were to have one of those emergency scenarios, it would also provide pressurization to the suit. 
Uh, and I think notable to mention that uh, these are these are different suits from what you might imagine for like the spacewalks and, and EVA suits. Um, these are what are called intravehicular activity suits meant for uh, really activity inside the vehicle. So what we just saw uh, as Chris Cassidy was down there in between the hatches in that vestibule space, he was affixing that docking target that we mentioned earlier. I like to say it's like an X marks the spot uh, because that's what the vehicles aim for when they arrive at the International Space Station. So one step closer to, uh, to bring in Bob and Doug home. And we're, we're actually really fortunate that the weather has turned out pretty good in the Gulf, uh, looking at a Pensacola landing site right now. Uh, we just, before we went on air today, about we had the two and a half hour uh, prior to undocking weather briefing and things, things are still looking good for an on-time departure today. Yeah, really glad to see the, uh, the weather cleared up, storm moved uh, back towards the Atlantic. Um, that, which opens up our, our opportunities for landing sites in the, the Gulf of Mexico, which uh, Gary had, had actually mentioned earlier, uh, Pensacola being the, the primary site today. Yeah, so as they continue work on the A-Pass hatch, uh, let's check in with Gary over on the International Space Station Mission Control Room side of things. Stand by, Gary. Thank you, Leah. Uh, we're watching the same view that you are seeing, Chris Cassidy, working on that A-pass hatch on the International Space Station side. As you saw, that uh, hatch on the Dragon side closed. Now, this is an important set of procedures that Cassidy is working right now. You already mentioned the docking target. This is that rod with the X at the end of it. X marks the spot, as Leah mentioned. Uh, this is an important item to affix to that A-pass hatch. Now, you see he set up a uh, camera just outside of there, and he's also going to be taking some pictures for the ground teams to uh, know exactly how the A-Pass was, was configured prior to uh, closing, uh, getting ready for some of those next crews. Now you saw there was a white padding on the outside of it too. That's just for a safety uh, measure as the crew was moving in between the hatches, uh, but uh, everything going according to plan here. That's A-Pass hatch uh, expected to be closed about 10 minutes uh, after closing the Dragon hatch, which was closed uh, just about 10 minutes ago. So it should be closing uh, very soon. Uh, the the uh, crew already just a little bit ahead of that timeline. So a few items coming up after that A-pass hatch closure. Now you see that hatch is on the station side. There's going to be a space in between the Dragon hatch and the International Space Station hatch. That space is called the vestibule. So about 15 minutes after they close that A-pass hatch, uh, they'll give a go for depressurization of that vestibule that is all controlled from the Dragon side. But we'll be watching very closely here in Mission Control Houston. Now, the... Uh, the, the press depressurization of that vestibule uh, does take quite a little bit of time. It takes uh, about an hour, actually, to get down to vacuum, uh, but the, uh, there's going to be a check at about five pounds per square inch. The check at five pounds per square inch uh, is going to take some time. It, it won't take too long to actually get to five PSI, but uh, once they actually get there, bringing that vestibule down to vacuum creates a little bit of temperature swings. Uh, so we need that to dampen out a bit before performing a uh, reliable leak check. That leak check will happen at the five PSI mark, and then we'll continue down closer to uh, depressurization towards vacuum. Now, that's uh, all coming up very soon. The go-no-go -no -go for uh, for uh, actual undocking to occur a little bit more than an hour after depressurization. That at about 4.20 p.m. Pacific. And if everything goes according to plan, so far the crew a little bit ahead of schedule. We'll get them undocked right on time. We're looking at 4.34 and 58 seconds p.m. Pacific time. Everything going great so far from the International Space Station side. Now back over to you in Hawthorne. Thanks, Gary. Now that Dragon's Hatch is closed and Bob and Doug have donned their suits, we'll be looking for the A-Pass Hatch on the station side to close very shortly. A-Pass is an acronym that stands for Androgynous Peripheral Attachment System. So you can see why we use an acronym, and it's an integral part of the docking system. Before closing it, we saw Chris Cassidy working to attach that docking target to uh, fine-tune any alignment for the approaching spacecraft. So it's not something required for the undocking, hey, but Dragon. obviously we need it to be there for the next spacecraft that arrives at that port. Yeah, and Gary had actually given us a... Anna, I got you loud and clear. Good to talk to you again today. How's everything going? 
Things are great. I'm super excited to be here. So I think what we heard there was a comm check between the core here in Hawthorne Mission Control up to the crew. Uh, that's a very good sign. That means that they're well underway into their suit donning procedures. Um, suit donning just referring to getting into their suits. And uh, one of the first steps there is checking that the microphones work both in the cabin as well as in their suits. Now, uh, kind of what we were talking about earlier, once we get through suit donning, which will have a, a couple of steps involved in it, first with these comm checks, and then we'll actually do some pressure checks to make sure that the suits are leak tight. Uh, once we get through that, then we'll actually go through a quick poll. Uh, mission control teams will verify that we're go to depressurize the vestibule, uh, again, which is that space in between uh, Dragon's forward hatch and the station's A-pass hatch on the uh, mating adapter, a uh, pressurized mating adapter on the Ford module. And as you saw, some flashes in that area down in the vestibule. That's Chris Cassidy, commander of the International Space Station, down in that space. Um, he's taking pictures, and he'll be sending those back down to the ground team so that they can check out how the uh, how the hatch closure procedure went, um, and he'll be able to provide those detailed photos for, for future use as well. Yeah, vehicle actually undergoing a number of reconfiguration steps at this point. Um, with crew, of course, on board, we have to make sure that our life support systems and thermal systems are all operating uh, as nominal. And um, this, the volume actually in between in the vestibule, that pressurized area, which is now at about 14.7 PSI, uh, will actually vent that through the, uh, some vent valves on the Dragon side of the system. So one of the two astronauts returning to Earth in Crew Dragon is Doug Hurley, the spacecraft commander for the Demo-2 mission. He previously flew on two space shuttle missions, as the pilot on STS-127 and again on STS-135, which was the final space shuttle flight. Here's a closer look at NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. Very excited, yeah, very excited. Still ready, still pumped? Oh yeah, I think we're ready. Uh, I think we're certainly ready. Joining the SpaceX Demo-2 test. He is a Marine Corps Colonel and test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 2000. He piloted Space Shuttle Endeavour and Atlantis for STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. Introducing NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. It's a life-changing process in so many ways to fly into space. It's just overwhelming in some, some respects. Just the sensations, the rumbling, the shaking, the acceleration. When the engines shut off and you go from, in the case of the shuttle, you go from three Gs to zero Gs instantaneously and things start floating. And, and I remember distinctly just thinking, what just happened? To see a rocket launch in person is, uh, it's a pretty emotional event. I remember the first time I saw a shuttle launch and it's just, it was amazing. And then when I saw a shuttle launch with my wife on it, that is, that is quite the emotional experience. My name is Doug Hurley, and I'm the spacecraft commander for the Demo-2 mission to the International Space Station. We are doing the first crewed flight for NASA and for SpaceX. So this is the test flight to prove end-to-end -end from launch to docking to ISS operations and then entry, descent, and landing. We'll wake up about six hours prior to launch. You'll eat breakfast, you'll do a medical check, you'll uh, start to get your comfort garments on, you'll get a weather brief, and then uh, you'll go get suited up. And it's the same suit up room that astronauts have been using since Apollo. And there they are, NASA astronauts. And then we'll walk out, jump in our Teslas, and we'll ride to the pad. 
We will board the vehicle roughly three hours before launch, go through all those pre-flight checks, and, and then uh, ideally we're off to the races from there at, at launch. Ignition, lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, bottom dog. It's a, about a nine to 10 minute ride to orbit. We'll go through the uh, on-orbit activities. Uh, we'll do some manual flying of the vehicle. We'll obviously sleep on the vehicle. Uh, and then we will continue through the rendezvous phase to where we end up in front of the space station uh, the next morning, uh, ready to dock. Endeavour, this is Houston. Bob and Doug, welcome to the International Space Station. We'll spend likely uh, a few months on space station. We'll be able to do some uh, onboard training with regard to undocking, entry, descent, and landing. Actually, getting to fly the mission with Bob, you know, we've been close friends for almost 20 years, so, you know, the whole experience for me is uh, what we're looking for. For Doug personally, he's he's worked so hard, I mean, through his entire life, to get to where we are right now. It makes me so happy to see that he gets to be part of this mission, the spacecraft commander. I'm just glad to see his hard work and his dream come true for that. We're so proud of him. It's been a huge amount of sacrifice and, and time away from home, but the fruits of our labor are, are coming to uh, fruition. Now with, uh, D with Doug is NASA astronaut Bob Benkin. He's the Joint Operations Commander for Demo2. He previously flew on two shuttle missions, STS-123 and 130, and he also served a tour as the Chief of the Astronaut Office. Why don't we learn a little bit more about him? go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's going to take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and, you know, we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task is to the uh, fly uh, into orbit for around the Earth when you are and turn and live and well uh, to talk about it. One, There's always zero, a, one, one. a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring Dragon, out a way to you know, collect the data. To press we hear a sound. Check okay, procedure. is that sound and an expected sound? And we see a light. Is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with Happy something day. else Welcome that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000, uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems, Dragon having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles. You know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. I think for me personally as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see me launch into space. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift 
off of the Falcon Line and Crew Dragon. Go NASA, go Space Duck, Godspeed, bottom dog. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. Uh, we'll do everything from actually talk from the Dragon vehicle to a uh, Russian Soyuz. We'll dig out all kinds of hardware that's stowed in the uh, nooks and crannies of the vehicle so that we have a, a good feel for how things are in place and uh, getting them back in place. We uh, plan to do all those things as a, just a part of our test mission. Welcome to Bob and Doug. I, uh, I will tell you the whole world saw this mission and we are so, so proud. I'm looking forward to that moment when he enjoys the accomplishment, when he realizes we did this, we, we did a great job, we accomplished what we set out to do. Whenever he lets himself feel that and experience that success, that's what I'm really looking forward to for him. For me, I'm looking forward to when he touches down at Ellington and the NASA plane that brings him home again at the end of it. I think that the, the thing I'm most looking forward to uh, uh, is, is actually ending up in the water safely at the end of the mission. Um, I'm expecting um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of vomiting maybe to happen in the yeah. end game. So when we yeah. get to that opportunity to do that, I'm looking for that kind of celebratory uh, event for both of us in the water at the end of the mission. <laughs>so uh cool great view on your screen uh that's from a camera behind bob and doug bob sitting in the right hand as we see him dragon and 2.5 uh two successful objects dragon spacex we see the same thank you So there's confirmation of uh, a couple of great milestones. Ford hatch is closed, suit donning is complete. We just completed suit leak checks. All everything nominal. Bob and Doug just raising their visors, uh, get a little bit more comfortable. I love this view because it makes me feel like I'm in the back seat of Crew Dragon, just going along for the ride. Uh, we did have, as you mentioned, a pass hatch closure during that brief video, as well as the beginning of suit leak checks. Uh, I've got a few milestones coming up. Next, we'll be looking for that vestibule depressurization, bringing that space down to a vacuum. That should be happening very shortly, hopefully within the next five minutes, actually. Yeah, so again, on your screen, left-hand side is uh, spacecraft commander Doug Hurley. Right-hand side is uh, spacecraft pilot Bob Binken, and also joint operations commander. Uh, in front of them are the three touchscreen displays in the Dragon spacecraft. And uh, with suit leak checks complete, the next major milestone, as you mentioned, Leah, is vestibule depressurization. So you can see they're uh, checking out all their screens. The crew will actually be monitoring during the departure portion of the flight. Um, on the way up, they had a couple of opportunities to perform some manual flight tests by piloting the vehicle and uh, checking those out and uh, you know, seeing how it would fly if you ever had to. But fortunately, it uh, is an autonomous vehicle. So the goal is that the astronauts are along for the ride, there to monitor and there to step in in case anything were to go wrong. But it should be an autonomous flight home. We're not stopping for any of those uh, flight tests along the way. That's right. trying to take a look here to see what the vestibule is currently pressurized at. Um, taking a look at the data, it's about 14.1 PSI, um, so pounds per square inch. Uh, for reference, at sea level on Earth, uh, we're at about 14.7 PSI, and if you're about 1,000 feet above uh, sea level, then you're actually at about 14.1. Um, just happened to look that up earlier today. <laughs> it looks like we might have lost the, the camera feed, might be another handover.
Probably so. We are waiting for that vestibule depressurization to begin. Uh, we're getting calls from the crew that they're getting ready for that. So uh, things are moving along smoothly. Everything is happening on time for an on-time departure from the International Space Station today. Yeah, and that call will actually be uh, the ground side. We'll do a couple of checks, make sure that we're, we're go and all of the data and telemetry on the Dragon side of the vehicle looks good and on the vestibule sensors look good. Then there should be a call to the crew from the core, letting them know that we'll go, in, that we're planning to step into commanding vestibule depressurization. Uh, and then we'll actually issue that command. Um, for this command, we are in uh, joint operations. So what that means is uh, the mission director, excuse me, the flight director in, uh, in Hawthorne, or in Houston at Johnson Space Center, the flight director of the International Space Station has mission authority for the mission. Uh, and any commands that we want to issue uh, to the spacecraft will actually have to get permission uh, from the flight director. And so we may, some of those calls will be happening in the background before uh, we actually begin that depressurization. Dragon SpaceX for status. The ground has verified system reconfigurations for hatch closure are complete and they are nominal. The ground will step into vestibule depressurization shortly. And finally, control of cabin air temperature via your procedure 4.080 is allowed at this point and note that the hex is currently configured for maximum cooling. Okay, copy off for decimal zero eight zero if we need to uh, change the temperature, appreciate it. And some words going up to the Crew Dragon crew from, as you mentioned, the core, uh, the crew operations responsible engineer here on the ground at SpaceX. Uh, they spoke with the teams in Mission Control Houston and decided, yes, they are uh, almost ready to begin that depressurization of the vestibule. This is the exact opposite procedure that we saw on the way up. And sounds like vestibule depressurization has begun. So as we mentioned, working to bring that space down to a vacuum in preparation for Dragon to depart today, that depressurization call coming at 3.04 p.m. Pacific. And moving pretty quickly, um, data shows we're currently at about 12 PSI uh, in the vestibule. Um, just dropped below 12 and only you know less than a minute ago we were at 14.1. And it uh, should only take um, five to 10 minutes to drop down to that five PSI uh, holding point that Gary had mentioned earlier. And that hold will be for 25 minutes while the teams make sure the uh, depressurization is due to the actual removal of the pressurized atmosphere and not a change in the temperature inside Crew Dragon. Yeah, a little bit of physics there. Um, if, uh, if you expand a gas, which is, which is what happening, what's happening here, we're taking the gas in the vestibule and venting it away. And so taking the, the molecules in that vestibule and sort of expanding them out, the temperature tends to drop. And so we'll want to wait for that temperature to equalize because as it warms up, the remaining gas will bump up a little bit in pressure. And that can look like a false leak uh, from either the International Space Station side or the Dragon side. Uh, so we give it uh, some time to equalize the temperatures. And uh, once, once we feel confident that the pressure is stable in the vestibule, then we actually perform the leak check and look to see that we don't have a drop in cabin pressure on the Dragon side, as well as uh, a rise in pressure in the vestibule. And things are moving quickly. Uh, we are actually already at 8.5 PSI, it's pounds per square inch, in the vestibule. And as you mentioned just a moment ago, we were at 14.1. So at uh, 8.2 now, and then we'll be waiting for that five, point, uh, 5 PSI point where we'll do that 25 minute hold. Yeah, and kind of kind of wild to think among the other fun facts I was looking up. So the, the pressure at, uh, at Everest is about four PSI. Um, so that, that'll kind of give you a sense of this, 
the pressure in the vestibule right now would be about similar to you being at maybe like 12,000 or 13,000 feet. Yeah, um, and very interesting. That's near the same pressure as in an EMU or an extravehicular mobility unit that the astronauts use uh, when they go outside on a spacewalk. They keep that at 4.3 PSI. That way they are more able to easily uh, move their fingers and, and their joints so that that work outside isn't as difficult. Now, something interesting to note on the uh, the extra vehicular or on the uh, the EMUs. Uh, so at at that like roughly four psi, um, where we're, you're not breathing the same mix of air that you would be breathing here on the ground. Um, here here on Earth, we'd be breathing something like 70% nitrogen and then about 20 something percent oxygen. You actually need the the concentration of oxygen to be higher. Um, so when you go to those lower pressures, those suits actually transition to oxygen, right? And taking a look at the data, it looks like we are at 5.9 PSI in the vestibule. So coming up pretty soon, we should be expecting that call of uh, having reached that 5 PSI level that we're waiting for for that 25-minute check. Mission controllers uh, that you can see on your screen, uh, specifically the well, who we refer to as the systems officer, will be monitoring for the pressure. Um, we'll also be looking for temperature checks uh, on that area. The uh, the systems officer is actually responsible for the uh, life support systems and thermal system on the vehicle, and so they're most familiar with that telemetry um, and able to make those calls for nominal uh, nominal leak check complete. Uh, and they'd also be responsible for checking that the vehicle configures into appropriate transition modes. And I uh, just heard that the initial depressurization of the vestibule is complete, looking at 5 PSI nearly on the dot. So I think what we can expect next is a call from the core up to the crew to let them know that the, the thermal hold period is beginning. Uh, and then we will probably also hear when the leak check is complete and the results of that leak check. So listening to, we're li kind of listening to the nets in the background, uh, just heard a conversation from the mission director prompting operators on uh, next steps uh, for start of this uh, thermal hold period and then the leak checks. Um, Bob and Doug really just sitting tight in the cabin at this point in their suits, uh, able to monitor all this information from their, their three touchscreen displays in the vehicle. Yeah, uh, and we heard that uh, we're about an hour and 20 minutes from the opening of the undocking window. So they get more than one chance today to undock. Um, on the way up, we saw the astronauts really only had that single second that they had to launch so that they would line up perfectly with the International Space Station. It's a little bit different coming home. Uh, those burns will really be what help us line up with our targeted landing site right now looking at Pensacola and a scheduled splashdown tomorrow. Now uh, there's a there's a view on your screen left hand side is the International Space Station so that's coming from uh, node 2 or the Ford node uh, looks like Commander Chris Cassidy taking a look down the the PMA and sealing up the the hatch Probably checking the seal, there, it looks like. Yeah, probably checking it for uh, FOD or foreign object debris, making sure that there's nothing, even a minuscule hair, that could uh, impair the hatches from uh, getting a, a good solid seal. So it looks like another handover of our TDRS satellite systems. Those are tracked. The uh, flight controllers know when to expect those, and so they can target their communications with the crew and any of those operations around that as well. And uh, now to actually probably be a great time to kind of hear what the mission control team in Houston is doing and what's going on on station side. Uh, Gary, can you give us an update? I sure can, Shiva. We're seeing the uh, same results uh, of the uh, vestibule depressurization. It went down pretty quick, but again, as you said, uh, we're looking for that thermal uh, stabilization before we perform the leak checks. We saw good leak checks from the crew's uh, suit-up procedures. The suit's looking pretty good. And then we just saw Chris Cassidy aboard the International Space Station finishing out his closeout duties of the pressurized mating adapter. That was that uh, long tube on the other side of the hatch that he just closed, uh, putting some items there, getting ready for the next crew uh, coming up later this year. He closed the A-pass hatch and configured that. 
for uh, for closure and taking some close out photos and checking for any uh, foreign object debris and then eventually closed that node to forward hatch. Uh, that'll complete Chris Cassidy's duties really aboard the International Space Station for today. The primary role of uh, undocking monitoring actually goes to Bob and Doug with uh, Mission Control Houston flight controllers monitoring from the ground. Chris Cassidy will be able to go inside the cupola. The windows are, uh, the shutters of the cupola windows are scheduled to be shut, but he'll be able to open them for situational awareness, take some good uh, closeout photos of Dragon departing. Right now we're just again in a holding period uh, for that vestibule depressurization, holding right, rock steady at uh, five pounds per square inch, five psi. That is the uh, final step. That is the final step, final check, really, uh, for um, deep vestibule depressurization until we get down closer to vacuum. And then of course we have the go no go for undocking coming up in just about an hour, and then eventually we'll get to uh, separation. Right now scheduled for just after 6:30 p.m. Central Time. 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. Everything looking good from the International Space Station side of things. Again, uh, uh, Cassidy's duties really wrapped up uh, for today, closing both of the station hatches. With that, we'll continue to monitor this thermal stabilization, ready to continue depressurization of the vestibule, coming up here shortly. With that, we'll pass it back over to you and Hawthorne. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. On your screen, uh, a view from that camera, looking at Bob and Doug's console. So a Wind Dragon undocks today, it'll actually weigh uh, over 27,000 pounds. We're looking at 27,600 pounds. Of course, in microgravity, that's nearly nothing. Uh, and they'll have about three days worth of food and snacks on board. So we're planning on them to get home tomorrow afternoon, uh, well, tomorrow midday for us here on the Pacific Coast. And so... Uh, those three days of, of food and snacks are there just in case there were to be some uh, some weather crop up that wasn't expected and they can remain in orbit for a couple of days after uh, undocking and, and be perfectly fine. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, the supplies that they have on board are really there in case we had a wave off scenario. Um, so if we were to have some kind of weather come in or something happened to the spacecraft where ground teams would want more time to, uh, to troubleshoot and understand and see if they could recover fault tolerance on the vehicle. That would, that would give them time to do a couple more orbits and then uh, try again at another opportunity. Right now, vehicle looking uh, very healthy. It's been very healthy the entire time. It's been attached to station. Uh, actually, the entire period while we were attached to space station, we were doing uh, weekly checkouts on the vehicle of the, the life support system, thermal system, uh, uh, power system, and the prop system on board. Uh, and uh, spacecraft has been pretty solid the entire mission. So while we are in this holding period right now of depressurization, we're, we're holding at that five PSI, five pounds per square inch uh, to make sure that there is no difference in temperature that's really causing that to fluctuate. Uh, a look ahead at the undocking. Um, we are expecting to see undocking last about five and a half minutes. And during that time, uh, undocking for Dragon looks a little bit different than for other vehicles. Uh, when the Soyuz is on the International Space Station, it undocks by using spring springs that push it away from the from the space station and Dragon will instead use a couple of uh, undock burns. So two small short burns, um, about 1.5 seconds for one of them and five for the other and those will just, just do just enough to bring Dragon away from the International Space Station so that it can, can conduct its uh, departure burns later. Yeah, Dragon actually has uh, 16 Draco thrusters on the base of the spacecraft, uh, 12 in what we call the service section of the spacecraft, and four that would be underneath the nose cone uh, around that Ford hatch. The nose cone Dracos, uh, the Ford bulkhead Dracos, as we like to call them, uh, are actually disabled for this portion of the mission and will be disabled for the next uh, three expected burns, which would be that undock one burn, undock two burn, and then uh, what we refer to as departure zero, which gets us on a path out uh, out of the approach ellipsoid and the keep-out sphere around the International Space Station. Uh, so these first uh, first three burns will actually only use the 12 surface section Dracos. Uh, and we actually have that many because of redundancy on the vehicle. So we could, we could lose certain combinations of those thrusters and still have full uh, d dimensionality control uh, and the ability to, to control the vehicle's position to apply thrust to it. 
So if you're wondering what's keeping Dragon attached to the International Space Station right now, there are two sets of hooks, uh, six on each side, so 12 hooks. And when that undocking sequence begins, um, the hooks will open and the umbilical, uh, which provides power from the space station to Crew Dragon, that will detach. And uh, then those short burns will fire and Crew Dragon will be on its way. Yeah, those, uh, those 12 hooks, uh, hard capture hooks, are actually what also provides the seal as well. So they ensure that the vestibule has that leak-tight seal. And uh, on, on the way up, when we docked uh, in late May, um, that, was, that was one of the major milestones uh, after we had attached, verifying that the, the soft capture system had uh, completely closed and that all those hooks had driven closed. So as you can see, NASA astronaut and commander of the International Space Station, Chris Cassidy, he's staying behind on the International Space Station for right now, and he'll return to Earth aboard a Soyuz in October. But he has just closed the Node 2 hatch. So uh, the uh, APAS hatch was closed earlier by Cassidy. Um, the Dragon hatch was closed and uh, now just you know, even creating a more firm seal by closing that node two hatch. And as you mentioned earlier, that's on the front end of the space station, if it really had a, a front side. So um, so that's where they are at. And uh, you saw him taking some pictures, recording that process, and he'll be able to deliver those to the ground later for, for analysis and, and just to check out at how everything went, this, this first departure for Crew Dragon with a crew. Good view from uh, the interior of Dragon. We're uh, looking at the pilot side seat. So that's uh, Bob Binken. And uh, you can see Doug Hurley's uh, hands on the, just behind him. Hey, Chris, uh, that call came down on Space to Ground 1, so I'm just going to read back on the big loop that we confirmed. And if you actually and look on the right hand. The two forward hatch and the MPEV are closed. And Chris, I owe you shortly um, what the undock sequence time is. And that was a call to Chris Cassidy on the space station, uh, checking out and making sure that they were just echoing that they saw that node two forward hatch closure. Things progressing well for an on-time departure. Um, when Doug and Bob got into the spacecraft today, they had a few housekeeping things to do. They wanted to make sure those footrests that you see right there are firmly attached for the ride home. Um, and then you can see a window over to the right of your screen. Those have had some window covers on them. Uh, they removed both of those, but they are still available so that when the crew go to sleep later tonight, they'll be able to put those window covers back up. That'll keep them from uh, seeing a sunrise every 45 minutes because, or a sunset because because the space station, as we mentioned, is orbiting Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. And so uh, they see quite a few beautiful views, sunrises and sunsets every day, 16 to be exact. Yeah, and you can actually kind of get a sense for how bright that might be. Um, spacecraft and the International Space Station are currently uh, not in the Earth's shadow, so in sunlight, and you can see how bright the window can get, uh, almost rivaling the lights in the cabin. Now that uh, window is actually right next to the side hatch. Uh, so you can see there's a, a, a black uh, strip next to that window. That's actually a, a hand rest, a uh, handhold. And next to that is the side hatch. And that's actually what Bob and Doug will be egressing out of after they do, uh, after successful reentry, parachute deployment, and uh, splashdown. Yeah, so that's what we saw the crew climb in uh, once they crossed that crew access arm, that last place that they were on Earth in that white room. Uh, they climbed in through that side hatch, but that's not what's attached to the International Space Station. Uh, the nose cone on Crew Dragon opens up and, as you said, exposes those thrusters underneath. Thrusters underneath, um, And they actually floated through that hatch. So um, they arrived through that one and departed through that one. But once they get back on Earth, that, that side hatch is the primary egress or exit from the vehicle for Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley. Yeah, and actually one of the, one of the steps uh, right when Bob and Doug had entered the vehicle on the la launch pad was to do a leak check of that hatch. Hatch remains sealed the entire time while we're in space uh, and really only gets opened once we're back uh, safely on Earth. 
So pretty noteworthy about this mission. This, there are a lot of firsts for this mission. Um, it's our return to flight from American soil for the first time in nine years, you know, since the space shuttle program. Uh, and it's also going to be the first splashdown in over 45 years. So actually on July 24th, just a couple of weeks ago, that was a 45 year anniversary of the last Apollo capsule splashdown with the Apollo Soyuz test project. So it's been a long time since we've seen a crew splashdown. That typically happens um, with a landing. Of course, the shuttle was an orbiter and could land like a plane. And then uh, the Soyuz, which astronauts have been arriving in for the past nine years, that lands on land uh, in the steppes of Kazakhstan. So this one we're looking to land in the Gulf Coast. Uh, it means a much quicker ride home for Bob and Doug once they get back. Yeah, once we get through the Earth's atmosphere, we'll have uh, two drogue chutes deploy and then four main chutes deploy. And then Splashdown uh, currently targeted for Pensacola, so off the off the west coast of Florida. And uh, recovery actually looks a little bit different than it, it did uh, 45 years ago. So we have uh, some pretty cool recovery boats, have helicopter pads on them, as well as a uh, what we refer to as, a, it's, it's, as an A-arm, but it's basically a crane on the back of the spacecraft. So, uh, excuse me, on the back of the boat. <laughs> um, and uh, a couple of fast boat teams will go out to the capsule, uh, verify that it's safe to approach, then that boat will come up, scoop up the Dragon spacecraft, put it on the, on the deck, they'll secure everything, and then uh, open up the hatches and uh, help Bob and Doug egress uh, onto the, on the recovery ship. If you've ever seen any of that, old Apollo footage, the astronauts actually used to get out in the water. And so a little bit different this time, the crew will be waiting until that boat arrives uh, with that crane to lift them up onto the deck and they'll, they'll get the chance to get out on the boat instead of uh, on the seas. Yeah, and actually for, uh, for recovery, we have seven potential recovery sites, what we refer to as uh, supported landing sites. So those are areas where a recovery team can get there very quickly, uh, recover the crew within a couple of hours of their, of their splashdown, uh, but usually actually much faster than that. Um, so we've got four sites in the Gulf Coast uh, on the west, uh, or in the Gulf uh, on the west coast of Florida, and then three sites on the east coast of Florida. Uh, one of them, of course, being Cape Canaveral. So as we were watching this this past week, this tropical storm uh, become a tropical or become a hurricane, there was some concern about about returning today because we do have uh, some recovery criteria. Landing in the water is a lot more difficult than landing on land because you have to consider things like wave height and wind speed. Um, and and so we are looking at those spaces in the Gulf, and they're looking pretty good uh, compared to obviously the spaces on the east side of Florida, um, but. But yes, we, we have to take into consideration what the helicopters can arrive in and um, what all the boats can withstand and what, what the vessel, it's the crew capsule itself can withstand. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, the hurricane uh, Isaias uh, moving up, I think, the, west, the east coast of Florida now. So hopefully folks are staying safe out there. I know uh, Doug actually took some photos from the cup, uh, cupola of, of this hurricane as it's moving up the east coast. But luckily, um, no major impact to weather on the west coast. Um, good winds, uh, no significant lightning, no significant rain is projected for the area. Um, and I, I think importantly as well, the, the wave heights, which are uh, important for the spacecraft, but also for the recovery ship to be able to get close and for teams to secure the spacecraft and ensure that it's safe for recovery. So currently we are in a hold period of the vestibule depressurization. That's the area between the hatches uh, that the astronauts fly through or uh, float through when they <laughs> arrive and float through when they depart. Uh, so we are holding at five pounds per square inch uh, for 25 minutes to make sure that, that that checks out and they continue with depressurization after that. But Bob and Doug, as you can see, uh, this view over their shoulder, it makes it look like we're on the ride with them. Um, they have donned their suits, they are in their seats, monitoring everything on those screens aboard Crew Dragon. Uh, why don't we actually check in with Gary at uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, uh, hear how things are going on the space station side, and how do things look at Johnson, Gary? 
Hey, Shiva, things are looking great here. We are also watching that uh, vestibule uh, depressurization, uh, of course, complete now holding at 5 PSI. We're just looking at that thermal stabilization, just waiting for it to stabilize, balance out uh, its swings so we can get a nice solid leak check before continuing down close to vacuum. Uh, on the interna International Space Station side, we did close the A-pass hatch, affixing that with a docking target. It's a rod with a little X at the end of it. Uh, Chris Cassidy performing those duties and taking some closeout photos, just making sure that everything was okay, checking the configuration, and that'll be reported to teams here on the ground uh, so they understand the configuration uh, for future crews to visit. He then loaded up that pressurized mating adapter. That was that tube that he was uh, on the other side of which was closing the A-pass hatch, putting some items in there for storage, and then eventually he did successfully close and lock the node 2 forward hatch, completing his duties for the day. So he will uh, be, of course, watching Bob and Doug depart the station. He'll be in the cupola module. This is that seven bay window that looks right down on the earth, provides a very good view of the dragon departing from the forward end of the International Space Station. He'll have a camera right in his hand and be able to take some pictures as they uh, depart the International Space Station. But the primary monitoring role will actually be in the hands of Bob and Doug, the Dragon vehicle being an autonomous departure vehicle, uh, Bob and Doug being able to take control if, if necessary with the monitoring role, and then the backup monitoring role uh, here in Mission Control Houston. So as soon as we continue this depressurization of the vestibule close to vacuum, uh, just about uh, 4.20 uh, p.m. Pacific time, we're looking to conduct a go, no go. That's, uh, I think, a little bit less than an hour from now at this time uh, that we'll conduct a go, no go to start the uh, undocking sequence. So the undocking sequence will be uh, um, detaching the umbilical and then uh, releasing a s 12 hooks in sets of six, two sets of six. There's going to be two pulses that are going to be fired from the dragon end. They're called undocking burns, and they'll actually physically separate a uh, dragon vehicle from the International Space Station. That's scheduled uh, just a little bit after 4.30 p.m. Pacific time today. So far, everything looking good. Holding steady right now, 5 PSI, looking to continue that depressurization here soon. With that, everything looking good from the International Space Station Flight Control Room. We'll send it back over to Hawthorne. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that update. Um, if you're just joining us, we uh, the Dragon spacecraft is currently forward hatch sealed. Um, the uh, earlier today, Bob and Doug had actually uh, loaded some powered cargo into the vehicle, and the life support system is reactivated. And then uh, after uh, sealing the hatches on both the International Space Station side and uh, stepping into the spacecraft, we did some leak checks on the suits to step into uh, vestibule uh, leak checks now. Yeah, and so that vestibule area, we're holding at five PSI, five pounds per square inch to uh, to conduct and make sure that it is holding and, and not fluctuating due to any temperature changes. Um, actually, the crew on the International Space Station, as I mentioned earlier, this is evening for them. And so it's actually 10.30 almost uh, aboard the International Space Station, 10.30 p.m. Um, and so they'll, they'll be getting ready to go to sleep soon. Um, the crew here in Crew Dragon had a, got to take a, a three-hour nap today in the middle of the day. Um, looks like actually the whole crew was able to, to enjoy that nap. That way they'd all be um, alert and, and ready to conduct these departure procedures, whether it be um, sealing up the hatches or, or conducting any of the leak checks, monitoring the ride home. We want to make sure the astronauts are well-rested. And, and uh, even though the crew on the International Space Station will get their sleep period soon, uh, we'll see Bob and Doug get theirs. They'll have about eight hours later tonight to get some shut eye. Yeah, that'll actually uh, sleep shift them well uh, before they start to step into the deorbit burn, uh, which is actually the, the largest burn of the day and actually a pretty dynamic period, uh, time for them. So I want to make sure that they are all well rested so they can monitor and step in if they have to take any contingency actions uh, and also read back on, on the status of the vehicle if uh, ground control teams are, are unable to to uh, properly assess the, the health of the system. Of course, uh, one of the nice things about having crew members aboard is they can see the, the health of the vehicle and they can respond. Um, Bob and Doug able to issue commands via those touchscreen displays and uh, also getting quite a bit of training on emergen potential emergency scenarios, um, wave offs, uh, scenarios where they might need to interact with, with Dragon and if it were to lose comms or have a thruster issue. But right now, very healthy vehicle, um, 
haven't haven't really seen any issues with Dragon uh, during its 63-day stay at the International Space Station. And if you are wondering, uh, once Dragon departs today from the International Space Station, we're not going anywhere. We're actually going to be live all the way until they come home to Earth tomorrow. So uh, some of the, the bigger things we can look forward to after undocking, we've got a couple of departure burns. The first two are going to bring Dragon up and over the International Space Station. And then the next two will bring it down and in front of the space station uh, before a phasing burn later this afternoon to help it really, uh, really sync up with its landing zone for tomorrow. That's right. I think I might have heard a call. Heard a little something. Okay, there might be a call coming to on the uh, space to ground. We'll be sure to keep an eye out for that. Looks like pressure in the vestibule is still holding. Yeah, and so as part of those uh, those burns that they have to do, the first couple of burns are really just to adjust the apogee and the perigee. So the, the apogee, if, if you can imagine uh, the orbit of a spacecraft as an ellipse going around the Earth, the apogee is the, the highest point or the point farthest away from the planet, and the perigee is the lowest point. And so right now, uh, Dragon uh, and the International Space Station, of course, still docked, and they're in a roughly circular orbit. Um, the, uh, at the, after the conclusion of these departure burns, Dragon's apogee will be about 10 kilometers below the International Space Station, but will be slowly reducing our perigee. And then uh, later on tonight, uh, Pacific time, we'll actually conduct what's called a phasing burn. And uh, the goal there is to adjust the orientation of that orbit just so we get our, our orbital pathway to line up over the landing site where we will, uh, or line up with a path that will cross over the landing site where we can, uh, when we issue our departure burn sequence, we'll be able to line up landing uh, off the coast of Florida near Pensacola. As you can see, Bob Banken and Doug Hurley in their suits now, but after those first couple of departure burns, they'll actually be able to take off their suits and they won't need to put them back on or don them again until uh, until tomorrow, just before the deorbit burn. And then they'll wear them the entire rest of the ride home. But for the majority of uh, the rest of the evening after that departure burns one and two, they'll be able to take off those spacesuits, relax a little bit more, enjoy their ride in Crew Dragon. Um, and while Crew Dragon was in on the International Space Station, we actually conducted some habitability test. Uh, of course, there's two astronauts flying today, uh, but our future crews are scheduled to have four astronauts. So we brought in a couple of the space station's current residents to test out what it's like to have multiple people in Dragon once it's in microgravity. Um, performed lots of tests inside the vehicle. Uh, they they had a little sleep period uh, to see how it would be to sleep with four people in the vehicle, and, and things went pretty well. Looking forward to that first Crew-1 launch later this year. Yeah, so right now, uh, Dragon and the International Space Station, about um, 422 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And uh, going about 7.6 kilometers per second, which would be uh, close to that 17,500 number that you probably hear pretty often. Yes, and if you're looking at miles, it looks like we're about 261 statute miles above the Earth. And they are in the South Pacific Ocean. They'll be coming up across Hawaii not too long from now. There's a view from the International Space Station looking at the Dragon spacecraft. So uh, Bob and Doug inside the uh, portion towards the right of your screen. Um, if you can imagine uh, how they're seating upright, uh, their displays would sort of be looking up towards the direction the nose cone is opened up. And uh, behind them is the trunk of the spacecraft. So that top side, the, the black shiny part, is actually our solar panels uh, on the body of the, the spacecraft. And below that, the, the white side of the spacecraft is the radiator. So that's where we're radiating away our heat uh, generated by the avionics and uh, um, the electronic hardware aboard the vehicle, and of course from Bob and Doug themselves. Generating a little bit of heat uh, based on how much physical activity and exertion they're doing. Right now it looks like they're uh, pretty comfortable, just uh, kind of hanging out in their suits. And actually the vestibule leak check has started. And so they're testing to ensure the solidarity of uh, those seals between the hatches. And as we saw earlier, they checked to make sure there was no foreign object debris or FOD uh, so that they would have a clean seal and, uh, and be able to 
to complete this leak check successfully, another step toward undocking. Uh, these leak checks should be pretty fast. They'll be looking to see if there's any pressure rise on the, the vestibule itself, which would indicate uh, pressure coming through the forward hatch seal. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Vestibule thermal stabilization is complete and the leak check period has started. Additionally, the Dragon to Ground path is now available. If you would like to swap one of your audio destinations to Dragon to Ground, I am happy to support a comm check at this time. Okay, Bob will be there. SpaceX, Dragon, comm check, Dragon to Ground. I hear you loud and clear, how me? And Anna, you're came in very quiet. I'll uh, bump up that channel and uh, maybe we could try it again. Copy, how is this? That's a little bit uh, better, Anna, but uh, kind of uh, cranked up to be able to hear you just uh, for your awareness. A little bit different volume between the big loop and uh, hearing you on a big loop and hearing you on Dragon to Ground. Copy. I will make sure to talk loudly into the Dragon to Ground path. And Dragon, Houston on Dragon to Ground for a comm check. How do you copy me? And Houston, we have you loud and clear on Dragon to Ground. Actually, my bad. I was not on the correct loop. Um, comm check again on Dragon to Ground from Houston. Okay, Leslie, we have you loud and clear on uh, Dragon to Ground, uh, much clearer, much less echo on this uh, loop than the big loop. That's a good data point, and we also have you loud and clear down here. So we just heard some comm checks between the crew aboard the Crew Dragon and uh, the core here on the ground and then with the Capcom in Houston. They're two very similar positions. Uh, we call ours the Capcom because it stands for Capsule Communicator and we are in a capsule once again. Uh, for a few years there, obviously we we're flying a space shuttle, so not quite a capsule, but before that we had Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, all capsules and, and this person uh, was once used to be typically an astronaut uh, so that they could communicate any specific details about the vehicle, especially based on their previous experience. Um, now we have Capcoms who are not necessarily astronauts, but obviously very, very well studied in the vehicle. Yeah, the, the way we refer to them is the crew's advocate on the ground. Um, they're trying to think of things ahead of their crew and have information that the crew might need where, where, uh, but they tend to act as the, uh, the advocate for the crew on the ground, uh, letting them know where uh, equipment might be stored in the vehicle, letting them know of upcoming steps. Um, if there's any troubleshooting that the crew need to do or information that the crew need, uh, they interact with the crew. Uh, typically also train very closely with the crew in simulations and also during their training periods to get them familiar with all of the procedures that they need to operate in the spacecraft. Now, during those comm checks, uh, there was some discussion about the, the big loop and dragon to ground and space to ground, a lot of different uh, loops. Uh, really, what a loop just refers to is a communications link. Operators all have the ability to uh, talk on these loops and provide real-time communication. Usually, they are redundant loops, so if you had a problem with one of the comm systems, then uh, there's a redundant backup, so you can ensure you have good voice communication with the crew. And uh, once we get away from space station outside of the, the keep out sphere and uh, the approach ellipsoid, we'll actually transition to what's referred to as Dragon to Ground. So we'll be issuing uh, a lot of that communication via Dragon's uh, transmitters through those TDRS satellites back to ground.
So as we mentioned earlier, 63 days aboard the International Space Station for these two spacefarers. It was not their first flight. They both had two previous shuttle missions, uh, and they both have families that are very excited to see them once they get home. I know some folks here around at SpaceX refer to them as the space dads. Both have young boys, and uh, I know that they have to be excited to get back to their families soon. And the uh, space dads actually brought a cool zero-g indicator up with them, um, uh, an apatosaurus, a kind of sparkly apatosaurus, uh, who was sitting in the seat next to them for the ride up. And uh, as I understand, their, uh, their sons actually voted that uh, that was going to be the zero-g indicator between the two of them. They're also bringing something really interesting and with a, a lot of history to it back to the ground. Uh, there was an American flag aboard the International Space Station that flew on the first space shuttle mission and the final space shuttle mission. Um, and it was left aboard the space station. That way it could be retrieved by the next crew who launched from America. And so they are also bringing home that piece of history as well. Yeah, so I was uh, looking up some facts earlier, the first space shuttle mission in April uh, 1981. So that flag has been to space uh, quite a while and uh, it's been on station now for about nine years, um, which is a pretty long time to be in space. Yeah, it's probably traveled more miles than any human ever uh, <laughs> or any astronaut ever for sure. So if you're just joining us, uh, we're currently looking at uh, two views inside the Dragon spacecraft. Um, the, right now in the seats are uh, spacecraft commander Doug Hurley uh, on the left-hand side, uh, or in the left-hand seat, and uh, Bob Benkin, the joint operations commander, in the right-hand seat. The, uh, the crew got on board. They've had a relatively busy day packing cargo on board the spacecraft. Uh, they closed the Ford hatch and the A-pass hatch uh, on the pressurized mating adapter on the International Space Station side. And uh, they're currently in the middle of a vestibule uh, leak check. So the vestibule, the space in between the two spacecraft, the two spacecraft being the International Space Station and Dragon. So we've uh, brought that down uh, to about five PSI at this point and uh, verifying that there's no leakage th from either side. The International Space Station is also in the current proper configuration for that departure. Uh, they do something called feathering the solar arrays. And so what they do is uh, they turn and lock them at an angle. That way, when Dragon leaves the space station, obviously it's going to use its thrusters. And those thrusters have exhaust that are emitted. And we don't want those to contaminate any of the solar cells on the arrays because that makes them less functional. Uh, they can't perform as well if they're, if they're coated in exhaust. And so those exhaust plumes, um, avoid the the solar arrays because they are feathered um, and and we also just don't want to put extra stress on the solar arrays so it sounds like the international space station and uh is, is set up well for the upcoming departure of crew dragon and uh as kind of a preview of what's happening on the ground side so operators and mission control uh in houston and of course operators here mission control on hawthorne uh, looking at the health of the vehicle systems. Uh, right now we are in what are called joint operations because of our proximity to the International Space Station. And so in joint operations, the flight director out of uh, Houston is actually the prime authority for any commanding or anything that'll occur uh, on uh, up in space close to the International Space Station. So both teams are conducting health checks uh, against a set of what we refer to as flight rules to check on the health of the vehicle, uh, configuration of the vehicle, and then verifying that their procedures are go for undocking. Um, all those checks happening concurrently with this leak check.
Yeah, and we'll be in those joint operations uh, through the exit of the approach ellipsoid. So there are two invisible lines, sort of, that vehicles cross upon arrival and departure from the International Space Station, and these help us govern, uh, you know, we have specific rules for each one that the vehicle shouldn't cross if um, if they violate any of those. And so some of those, for the keep-out sphere, that smaller sphere around the space station, um, we call that four orbit safe. So if the Dragon were for to some <laughs> were to for some reason lose control of any of its thrusters, um, it would be safe for four orbits. If, if like not hitting the International Space Station, um, if it's inside that keep out sphere, and then the approach ellipsoid has a little bit of a lesser uh, time frame. You need to be 24 hours safe, um, and that gives time for the teams on the ground to troubleshoot anything that might arise. Uh, as we mentioned, if if there were some reason they couldn't send commands to the vehicle, or um, the vehicle couldn't be commanded by the astronauts. So those are typically hold points on the way up for our visiting vehicles. But on the way home, we won't be stopped. Any, uh, we'll be heading straight for Earth uh, with a splashdown planned for tomorrow. Here's an external view of uh, the Dragon spacecraft from the International Space Station. Uh, that uh, structure that you see, kind of hemispherical structure on the top, is actually the nose cone. And then on the right hand side of your screen is that pressurized mating adapter that we saw the crew in earlier. So, Commander uh, Chris Cassidy uh, aboard the space station closing the APAS hatch and Node 2 forward hatch on those two. And of course, Bob and Doug closing the Dragon forward hatch. And uh, much later on in the mission, uh, right before we are planning to step into, uh, right before we really re enter the, the Earth's atmosphere, we'll end up closing that nose cone to protect the sensors and thrusters uh, that live underneath it. Another thing we'll also see happen is the jettison of the trunk. And so the trunk was on the end of Crew Dragon. You could uh, see it had the solar cells wrapped around it, uh, helping Dragon gather power from the sun. And uh, that'll be removed. You, there you can see it again. It's got some fins on it back there. That will not return to Earth with the Crew Dragon capsule. That will actually uh, burn up upon reentry into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and that's where, on the way up, we would be able to store any unpressurized cargo. So if there were something that we'd like to install, on the outside of the International Space Station, that would be a good place to put it, um, and the astronauts could could use that. Um, it's it's an extra trunk. I mean, it's exactly what it is. So <laughs> it's not for any of their personal luggage, but uh, it's great for any of that unpressurized cargo. Yeah, those uh, aerodynamic fins are actually pretty important. Uh, if there were uh, a launch escape event, those aerodynamic fins provide stability to uh, the vehicle if it, as it were to separate from Falcon 9. Uh, of course, we didn't need to see that um, during this mission, and uh, hopefully we won't see that uh, uh, ever. Ever, <laughs> uh, ever since the uh, in-flight abort mission yes. that happened. Um, and the uh, back on... The, the trunk also contains the thermal coolant loops for the vehicle, so we radiate away heat uh, to space. Um, of course, on, on planet Earth, you can sort of just push a breeze by you um, to, to get some nice cooling, but in space, you have to radiate away all that heat because there is uh, it's a vacuum around you, so you can't take advantage of convective uh, heat transfer away from the spacecraft. Although interesting tidbit, there is just enough of an atmosphere uh, to, to be, be a drag. And actually, uh, the International Space Station needs to do periodic reboosts uh, to stay in its orbit, right? And they did one of those very recently uh, that was factored into Dragon's departure um, procedures as the International St Space Station used its thrusters to reboost it. And in preparation for uh, this October, when it will have a Soyuz vehicle arrive with some brand new crew members. And so this was factored into Dragon's departure sequence, knowing at which altitude the International Space Station would be flying. And it looks right now the International Space Station is flying 262 statute miles over the North Pacific Ocean. It looks like they will be crossing into uh, North America soon and specifically coming up over the coast of Oregon. A kind of a preview of what's coming up next. Um, currently, conducting a leak check of the vestibule. Uh, now, 
particularly important because any breathable gas that you bring with you into space is, is what you bring on your spaceship. Um, so the International Space Station with the supply of breathable gases and of course Dragon with, uh, with tanks aboard that contain nitrogen and oxygen. And the life support system providing periodic uh, injections of oxygen to keep the cabin uh, at about 25, 20 to 25% oxygen, which is uh, about what we would have actually here on Earth. So doing a leak check, making sure that we're not losing any of that precious breathable gas uh, through the forward hatch seal, um, which has been open really this entire time while we've been on space station. We've seen a few milestones happen so far today. Of course, we've got a lot to look forward to, but uh, we saw the Dragon Hatch close earlier after Bob and Doug were safely inside. Uh, shortly thereafter, Chris Cassidy closed the space station side. Uh, that's the A-pass hatch, and then eventually the Node 2 hatch. That allowed us, allowed us to step into this vestibule depressurization period, bringing that space in between those hatches down to as close to a vacuum as we can possibly bring it uh, before departure later. So yes, now conducting those leak checks. Um, and then we will be looking for a go, no go for undock coming up at 420 Pacific. So during that uh, go, no go um, for undocking, ground operators will be looking at the health of the vehicle systems, verifying that everything seems pressure and leak tight, uh, verifying the configurations of both the Dragon spacecraft and the International Space Station. And then we'll actually expect to hear uh, a call up to the crew, see if they're ready to, to come on home. And then uh, ground operators here in uh, Hawthorne will issue a command to the Dragon spacecraft that will begin the process of uh, detaching the umbilicals that are providing power and telemetry from the space station to the Dragon spacecraft, and then actually removing those 12 hard capture hooks that are keeping the vestibule uh, leak tight right now. And Dragon will do a couple of, uh, of undocking burns as well, uh, short little thrusts. Yes, two. From the service section. Uh, very short. Well, actually, specifically be 1.5 seconds and then another for five seconds. So uh, I think Gary described them earlier as pulses. I think that's a great way to describe them rather than necessarily as long as a burn. Um, but even our departure burns later are, are short to start off with. Uh, departure burn zero looking to be about 12 seconds long and then departure burn one for 20 seconds. And those increase the opening rate between the spacecraft and the International Space Station. And after that departure burn one, they can take off their suits, get comfortable and relax until time for that deorbit burn tomorrow. Yeah, the deorbit burn is a, a pretty big burn and the departure phasing burn is actually a very large burn. Uh, departure phasing should last about six minutes or so um, and the deorbit burn will actually be on the order of nine to ten minutes. Um, the, definitely the largest thrusts of, of at least the return portion of the mission. And uh, for, for the phasing burn, that's really to line us up with our potential landing site over Pensacola in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, the deorbit burn will reduce our perigee, or the lowest point of Dragon's orbit, so that we end up getting caught by the Earth's atmosphere. Um, Dragon will actually then get a chance to use its heat shield and uh, slow down against the Earth's atmosphere. And then once we get to the right uh, sort of pressure characteristics and altitude characteristics as sensed by the vehicle, then we'll have the drogue chutes deploy, slow us down even further before finally seeing those four main chutes deploy uh, that'll bring Dragon down to a nice gentle landing uh, in the the ocean. And I learned something really interesting about parachutes. So whenever you see those drogue chutes deploy, they don't automatically inflate right away. That's because they're doing something called reefing. And that keeps the air from flowing into the parachute too quickly and shocking the, uh, the parachute system on Crew Dragon. So they expand very slowly and uh, begin to slow the vehicle down rather than all at once and, and giving a jolt to the spacecraft. Yeah, and actually even with the, the drogue chutes and the main chutes opening slowly, uh, Bob and Doug will still experience somewhere between four and five Gs of acceleration. Um, so, you know, one G is what we experience sort of just standing here. If you can imagine yourself being four times or five times as heavy um, just for that, that brief period of time, that's about how much force they'll experience. Uh, of course, both of them test pilots. Uh, test pilots usually train up to, depending on if you're in the Navy or the Air Force, seven to nine Gs. Um, so nothing that they're, they're probably unfamiliar with. 
So you've got this really good close-up view of Crew Dragon attached to the International Space Station. That's the Node 2 forward hatch. You can see the nose cone is open. Uh, that will be closed later after the departure burn and prior to re-entry, but that is how the astronauts ingressed uh, or entered the International Space Station when they arrived 63 days ago and how they exited the space station when they prepared to depart today. So uh, this is a great view and uh, that's where we will begin to see some movement once that undocking command is, is sent later this afternoon. So some more facts about our astronauts today. Um, we mentioned that they uh, have had two previous flights on the space shuttle, uh, and this is their first flight not on a space shuttle. And so uh, they both just logged 63 days aboard the space station. It'll be 64 by the time they return home. Um, so. Doug Hurley will have a total of 93 days in space over his three space flights, two on the shuttles, including that last shuttle mission. Um, and then Bob Bankin will have logged a total of 92 days in space over his three flights. So very close there. Um, but adding up some time aboard the International Space Station. And uh, Bob Bankin actually getting uh, some pretty cool opportunities to conduct a number of spacewalks with uh, Chris Cassidy going outside the space station, uh, conducting some work to replace power units uh, and batteries on the space station? Yes, they actually uh, replaced some older nickel hydrogen batteries with some newer lithium ion batteries. And these upgrades have been going on for a few years now. Um, and the astronauts were very efficient. They conducted four spacewalks, Chris Cassidy and Bob Benkin. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Doug Hurley was inside and he was controlling the Canada Arm 2. That's the robotic arm on the International Space Station. Um, and so so all three with a very important role in those spacewalks. Um, and it became a, quite a milestone for Benkin and Cassidy. Uh, they both now have conducted 10 spacewalks in their career. And that ties them with the most spacewalks by an American astronaut. Um, they're now tied with 10 with Mike Lopez Alegria and uh, Peggy Whitson. Dragon SpaceX, we had a good vestibule leak check. I can copy. It's good news. Thank you. There's confirmation from the core of a uh, successful leak check on the vestibule. Uh, that means one more milestone down and getting ready for undock. Yeah, and that wraps up the completion of those leak checks, as you mentioned, in that small space between Crew Dragon and the space station, the vestibule. Uh, it was brought down from a pressure of, it looked like 14.1 uh, pounds per square inch and then to five. So they had that, that hold period and then conducted leak checks. Um, but that 14.1 was the same as the rest of the station. Now they are um, offset quite a bit. And so they're going to bring that all the way down to vacuum uh, since that's what they will be exposed to, the hatches, I'm once Crew Dragon Endeavor begins its journey home. Yeah, and actually, if we didn't bring that space down to vacuum, then uh, it, would, it would almost act like a thruster. Um, there'd be a little bit of pressure left up in there, and so as the seals came, uh, or as the seals were sort of opened up and we removed those hard capture hooks, we'd see a little propulsive thrust. And uh, of course, being this close to station, we want every maneuver to be very carefully choreographed, so trying to make sure there's as little energy imparted by those, that little bit of pressure in the, the mating adapter. So actually, now a, would be a great time to hear what's going on uh, at Mission Control Houston and get an update on the space station. Gary, can you let us know how it's going? Hey, 
Hey, Shiva, we're watching the depressurization of the vestibule now. It's a little bit less than 4.5 PSI, a little bit slower than what we saw just a little bit an hour ago when we went from about uh, the pressure of uh, sea level down to 5 PSI, that really only taking a few minutes. This one's a little bit slower, but we are seeing a good depressurization of the ves vestibule, uh, those all being controlled from the Dragon side, and we're monitoring here from Michigan Control Houston. Now, some of the views you might see from the outside uh, of the International Space Station looking at the Dragon vehicle, some of those cameras being controlled from Mission Control in Japan. Working from here in Mission Control Houston with the Japanese Mission Control Room to make sure we're going to get good views with those cameras. We're going to get a little pan uh, as, the, uh, as the Dragon makes its way away from the International Space Station. And that first departure, burn departure, burn zero, uh, brings it uh, a little bit faster away from the station. We'll get a nice view from the Japanese side of the International Space Station. Right now, the International Space Station configured uh, for undocking. We do have those solar arrays feathered. That's in a locked position. Station Houston on the big loop. Endeavor's undock sequence start time is planned for 2330 GMT. That is 28 minutes from now. You heard that from Capcom here in Mission Control Houston. That is Leslie Ringo here in Mission Control Houston. That start time is uh, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Central. That is the on-time start time for the undocking sequence. Uh, once that kicks off, uh, that'll be the first, the initiation of the umbilical retraction, uh, followed by 12 hooks that are keeping Dragon in place attached to the International Space Station. Those will drive and be released uh, six at a time. They're in two gangs, and then of course, there's two undocking burns, more like pulses, just short little burps, uh, that are going to physically separate Dragon from the International Space Station vehicle. You can hear right now everything going according to plan. We're right on the timeline. Uh, that physical separation, as long as we're on the timeline, should happen at 4.34 and 58 seconds p.m. Pacific time. Everything going well. We'll continue to monitor the depressurization of the vestibule from here in Mission Control Houston. Until then, we'll send it back over to you in Hawthorne. Thanks, Gary. So once Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley arrived at the space station on May 31st, it did not take them long to get to work. Uh, during the time on board the orbiting laboratory, as we mentioned, Bob Benkin ventured outside the hatch four times for spacewalks to upgrade those batteries. And Doug Hurley used the Canada Arm 2 to, uh, to command the station's robotic arm from the inside of the station. But when they weren't focusing on the outside of the station, they continued science and research inside the orbiting laboratory. Of course, as we we mentioned they also exercised the mandatory two hours each day. And many of you have seen uh, some of the incredible pictures that they took of our home planet. This is one uh, beautiful view of a sun glint off the ocean. And uh, then there's also one that we have from Comet Neowise in July. If you had the opportunity to see that from the ground, we, we uh, saw our astronauts had a great shot of that from the International Space Station. Yeah, they had some uh, really cool opportunities. We're sharing a lot of those photos on Twitter. And of course, you know, earlier this morning as they've been preparing for, for undocking, they had some work to do as well in packing cargo into the Dragon spacecraft. So underneath their seats, they've got room for powered and unpowered cargo. Um, right now they're, plant they're bringing home about 150 kilograms uh, or about 330 pounds of cargo. Most of that is science and uh, sampling hardware, about 94 kilograms or about 200 pounds of it is science that's happening aboard the space station. And uh, Dragon does have the ability to return a lot of that cargo so it can come back to labs here on Earth who can continue to do uh, human uh, science studies on, on those biological samples and cold sample studies uh, on those cold samples that, that they're returning. Um, and it's really something that we've been doing even since our previous version of Cargo Dragon, uh, just continuing that capability with Crew Dragon. Yeah, that's one thing I was going to mention. When the astronauts know that there is a Crew Dragon or a, a, a Cargo Dragon vehicle coming, they know it's about to get really busy with a lot of science. Um, cause cargo Dragon is currently the only vehicle uh, cargo resupply ship we have that can bring back 
cargo. The others uh, disintegrate, burn up in the Earth's atmosphere upon reentry. Um, so we mentioned earlier that comet Neowise picture, and I think we have it now. Look at how beautiful that is, the comet streaking across the sky uh, just above the Earth below. I, I can't see. imagine. Yeah, especially to see the, the glow of the, the Earth's atmosphere kind of creating that blue sheen as the, the light refracts off of it. Really cool. And this was probably taken from the cupola window, um, and that's, as Gary mentioned, that bay window area on the International Space Station that faces down toward Earth. Uh, it's truly the best view in the house. Uh, Chris Cassidy might head over there after undocking today to take a look outside and watch as his friends depart. Uh, we, we saw that on the way uphill, he was in there monitoring their arrival and taking some pictures of Crew Dragon as it arrived as well. But uh, aside from all of that science talk, we'll also be returning some vehicle hardware like spacewalking cooling garments, which the astronauts wear under their extravehicular mobility unit suits. Um, there's, there's tubes of water that they can control the temperature of. So when they are in the sun um, outside of the space station, it can be up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And uh, when they are in the darkness and outside the space station, it can be negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So that cooling garment is also, in a way, a little bit of a heating garment um, and can help them control their temperature when they're outside on a spacewalk. So we'll be returning some of those. Um, also some glove connectors for refurbishment back on Earth. And along with any crew provision like food, small electronics, and even their sleeping bags. NASA will have cargo specialists embedded with the recovery team. They'll be able to quickly recover um, and unload that returned cargo very shortly after Dragon returns on the recovery ship to shore tomorrow. Yeah, and it was uh, you know really interesting. You're mentioning the the wide temperature variations. That's something you don't really see on Earth because we have air and we have humidity in the air that helps us sort of regulate that temperature. Of course, you don't have all that humidity and, and atmosphere around you to help with that. So when you're in the sun, you're getting the full brunt of that heat, and when you're not, you're getting the full coolness of being in eclipse. Um, and so that's that's part of the reason why you need those extra uh, vehicular suits as well as like the thermal systems on Dragon to uh, help regulate that temperature into something that is palatable for humans. And speaking of heat and atmosphere, when the astronauts re-enter tomorrow, they will be traveling or they will uh, experience temperatures up to 3,500 degrees outside the crew vehicle. Um, inside, it'll be nice and cool. They've got some air conditioning and their suits will have cooled air venting through them. So uh, that's a pretty, pretty fiery re-entry tomorrow. Another view on your screen of the Dragon spacecraft. And uh, now looking at a uh, camera that's positioned just behind uh, Bob and Doug. So Doug in the left-hand seat, Bob in the right-hand seat, uh, monitoring uh, the vehicle. Looks like they've got the Ford view. Um, so on each of their individual panels, um, you can sort of tell that because it looks like they've got an attitude ring in front of them. And then they've got a, a view in the middle that has uh, their, their procedures and cue cards up for what they can expect next. And speaking of which, actually, so the, the next thing we'll really see here is final uh, configuration for undocking. So there'll be a go, no go poll um, for, for issuing that final configuration. Uh, we're expecting that to happen, uh, the actual uh, command to occur right on time at, uh, at uh, 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. And then uh, shortly after that, we'll have a couple of those undocking bursts. Um, that will just separate any sort of friction, uh, any sort of forces that may have statically built up while Dragon's been hanging out on station, uh, and separation is as planned for 4:34 uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 4:34 and 58 seconds, actually. Yes. So from the time that command is sent from the ground to start undocking, as you mentioned, those hooks have to be retracted. Those uh, 12 hooks, two sets of six. Um, the umbil umbilical that has been providing power to Dragon from the International Space Station will detach, and they will use those two short bursts to uh, begin their journey home. 
Yeah, and a, a lot of those steps are, are automated once we issue the command for undocking configuration. Operators here in Mission Control will be monitoring that Dragon performs the correct uh, state transitions. Dragon has uh, flight computers aboard uh, that they're triplicated for redundancy. So if one of the flight computers gets out of sync with the others, you still have the other two to make a good call. And of course, we have ways of resetting them and trying to understand those faults. That's uh, part of the job of the Mission Controllers to make sure they understand the health and, and status of the vehicle. So those flight computers will transition the vehicle through a number of states um, and then activate those thrusters. We'll have a couple of short bursts from the service section Draco thrusters. So those are the thrusters uh, on the lower part of the vehicle, just above the, the heat shield and the trunk. Uh, and we won't be using the, the Ford bulkhead Draco thrusters um, that are underneath the, uh, underneath the nose cone. We'll see those two bursts that'll help take Dragon up and above, uh, away from the International Station into a slightly higher orbit, letting uh, Space Station move ahead. Yes, those will be departure burns zero and one. Um, and uh, then that'll just increase the opening rate, the distance from the space station and moving it out of the keep out sphere, as we mentioned earlier, and eventually the approach ellipsoid. Um, and then after it's out of the approach ellipsoid, it'll have departure burns two and three. Departure burn three, as you mentioned earlier, is like a co-elliptic burn. Uh, so it puts it on the same orbit all the way around rather than necessarily having a a widely varying apogee and perigee, or higher point of the orbit and lowest point of the orbit. Yeah, and we were talking a little bit about the keep out sphere and the approach ellipsoid. So those are those are uh, imaginary spheres. Um, the keep out sphere being a 200 meter um, radius, I believe, uh, sphere around the International Space Station. So that represents a space where any spacecraft that are in those operations need very choreographed maneuvers with the flight director uh, before they issue any commands or perform any thrusts. Station and Dragon crew on the big loop. I want to let you know that at this time we are removing ISS power to Endeavor. Okay. So a call there from the Capcom yes, saying copies. that both the station crew and of course uh, Bob and Doug um, no longer re receiving power from the International Space Station through those uh, umbilicals uh, on the docking mechanism. Yeah, so Dragon is operating on its own power uh, generated and gathered by those solar panels wrapped around the trunk of the vehicle. And uh, that's actually a very similar look to the new Cargo Dragon uh, for most of or for all of the Dragon missions until now, we saw solar wings um, with solar arrays. And now the cargo Dragon missions will have the solar arrays wrapped around the vehicle, uh, just like we see here with Crew Dragon. Yeah, and actually it's something that adds to the overall reliability of the vehicle. Anytime you have a mechanism in space that's uh, potential for something to go wrong, you need a motor to drive it. Um, you need checkouts potentially on the actuators. There's probably software that drives it. So having conformally wrapped uh, um, solar panels around the trunk of the vehicle reduces that little bit of complexity and actually ends up being a little bit lighter too. So we can add a little more cargo and, and add a little bit more uh, to other parts of the system. And on the other side of the trunk is the thermal radiator. So we've got a fluid running through that, almost like a, an air conditioner. And that fluid is being pumped throughout various different points in the vehicle. Um, actually, earlier on, we heard a call from the core mentioning that the crew could adjust the, the hex um, or heat exchanger to the position that they wanted to control internal cabin temperature. So uh, that, that part of the cabin air as it goes through the revitalization system is getting passed over that heat exchanger, and that allows the crew to keep it nice and uh, comfortable inside the cabin. I hope they both like the same temperature because I like to keep it warm, and uh, I hope they both like it cool or warm or they can agree on temperature for the long ride home. <laughs> Well, taking a look at some of their interviews, I think uh, Bob and Doug have expressed uh, just how close of friends they are. So um, I, I'm sure it's something that they've worked out over time. 
Um, I think I, earlier I took a look and it was about 76 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the, the cabin. So definitely to my tastes. Yeah, yeah, I could I could survive in that. <laughs> um, and yeah, you mentioned they are very close. They were selected as part of the same astronaut class. So they went through astronaut training together and um, ultimately remained very close friends and now get to fly a once in a lifetime mission like this. Yeah. I mean, flying a, a test mission together with your with your best friend has got to be very fun. Of course, our favorite space dads here at SpaceX. So uh, just a look at these two mission controls. On the left, you have the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston. And that's the team that's monitoring and uh, sending signals and, and controlling the International Space Station side of these operations. Um, it is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, we've always got someone in there protecting the, the astronauts in space, making sure that everything is working well on the International Space Station. Um, and then on the right, Shiva, why don't you enter Introduce us to the Mission Control Hawthorne. Yeah, so this is Mission Control in Hawthorne. It's actually right behind us uh, where we're sitting, standing here in Hawthorne. Um, and in that room is a number of specialists as well as the, the primary Dragon operators. Of course, if you've tuned in for some of our other webcasts, you've seen Mission Control as well. Uh, we use that same control room for Falcon missions, and that's where the Falcon operators uh, stand in. But today, that uh, the third row is where most of the primary operators are, and then we have a number of specialists sitting in and other rooms. Uh, folks who have really devoted uh, the larger part of their careers and a lot of their expertise to understanding the nuances of the life support system or the propellant system, and uh, even, of course, uh, the health and safety of the crew. We have a flight surgeon, uh, actually a NASA flight surgeon, who uh, is in that front row, um, and, and he's there as well to make sure that Bob and Doug, if they have any sort of complaints um, uh, from a physiological perspective, that he can weigh in and help them stay healthy. So really a, a, a big team to help make sure that Bob and Doug get home safely, both from the vehicle performing well, as well as their own individual health. Yeah, and speaking of the vehicle, uh, that vestibule pressure looking now at less than 0.3 PSI. So getting down there as close as it can to a vacuum. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that the astronauts have a, a flight doctor. They have somebody who's spe specifically assigned to them um, for all of their pre-flight medical and their in-flight medical and their post-flight. Um, somebody that, you know, is able to speak with them at almost any time um, and, and conduct health checks and um, just wellness checks and make sure that everything is going well while they're in this very, very environment of space. Yeah, I mean, among the, the cargo that they have aboard uh, is, is emergency medical kits and, and actually um, medical sort of uh, medicine and like trauma kits that they would use uh, if there were a significant medical emergency. And so the flight surgeon uh, can help them as they're working through first aid and give them specific instructions since uh, if, if they need to do anything in an emergency scenario, it, it's, it's those two taking care of each other. And of course, when, when the hatch was open, the entire energy National Space Station crew of this expedition taking care of each other. So at this point, we're about uh, 13 minutes away from the transition to for undocking. Uh, and then about five minutes after that, we'll have the two undocking burns happen, uh, really just short little bursts from those service section Dracos. Uh, we're expecting separation to happen around 4.35 PM Pacific time, just a few seconds before that. Uh, heard in a go no go poll earlier from the mission control teams that we were talking about earlier. So just like it's during its approach to the International Space Station, Dragon's departure and deorbit uh, is designed to be fully autonomous. So it requires no action from the crew on board. Um, Station Commander Chris Cassidy, he won't be the prime for monitoring Dragon's departure. That'll be done by the crew on Dragon. Uh, they'll be able to monitor with these screens you see here, and they'll be backed up by flight controllers on the ground. But as always, Bob and Doug will have the ability to send commands manually to the vehicle if they need to. And once the undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will then use its Draco engines. It'll thrust away from the station in a, in a series of pretty carefully choreographed maneuvers or four departure burns to increase that distance to, between the two spacecraft. And then from there, it'll perform a uh, phasing burn that will put it on the right trajectory to get back to Earth and the landing site. Next on its trip home is deorbit, entry and landing. And uh, that covers all operations after the final departure remover. That includes trunk separation, closure of the nose cone, uh, deorbit burn, and deployment of the drogue and main parachutes. And finally, splash down off the Florida coast, at which point our teams will recover Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley inside Crew Dragon from the water. 
At this point, uh, a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we always put in a little bit of margin into the schedule in case there were any problems with, for example, the suits or if the leak check didn't quite go as planned. Um, right now, the the uh, planned time to perform the undocking commands to the spacecraft will be around 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll expect to see Dragon go through a number of state transitions as well as uh, transitions of its life support system. And then shortly after, we'll see those Dracos come to life uh, very briefly just to unstick ourselves from the, the space station and then uh, thrust away um, from from where it's called home for the past 63 days. Yeah, and as you mentioned, those will be the service section Draco thrusters. Those are what are used when the spacecraft is around the International Space Station. Uh, we don't want to use something as powerful as those nose cone thrusters, uh, the forward bulkhead thrusters, I should say, just yet. But that's what we will see being used for the deorbit burn tomorrow. Yeah, those forward bulkhead thrusters are uh, just a little bit more efficient because they can expand the propulsive gases a little bit more. Um, sort of the, the principle of... of providing thrust to a rocket vehicle is you burn some kind of propellant or have some kind of gas that you expend from the vehicle. And that mass that you're ejecting away from your launch uh, or from your spacecraft is uh, through Newton's laws, um, pushing you and giving you some momentum. So uh, those forward bulkhead Dracos, when we uh, use the thrust out of those, the propulsive gases in there, we're able to more fully expand than we are on the surface section Dracos. It gives us a little bit better performance, but of course they're pointed directly at the space station. Yeah. So any of that propulsive, uh, propulsive gas that we're, that we're uh, shooting out from Dragon would, of course, go directly then to the space station, which is not ideal. <laughs> I just heard the call that Mission Control has, uh, Mission Control Houston is go Dragon for undocking. SpaceX on the big loop. The final reconfigurations for undock are complete and nominal. The ground is go for undocking at the undocking sequence start time of 2330 GMT. Please confirm your visors are down and that you are ready for undock and departure. Dragon copies, go for undock on time. Our visors are down and we're ready for departure. We got the O. And we just heard the confirmation. Dragon is a go to undock. So now we are waiting for the undocking sequence to actually begin. And they are targeting that for 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. So it looks like eight minutes from now. Um, and once that begins, it'll take less than five minutes for Dragon to separate from the International Space Station, which ha has called home for two months now. Now, the first step in the undocking uh, sequence, which is, again, automatic, is uh, for the umbilicals that are providing power, telemetry, and commanding capability between the Space Station Dragon for those to retract. Um, once those retract, we'll actually have Dragon perform an unlatch from the space station, releasing 12 hard capture hooks that are around the, the vestibule. Those hard capture hooks are what are providing that airtight seal around the vestibule, and they'll actually come in two separate phases. So we'll hear a, a call for six of those, and then we'll hear a call for all of those being uh, detached. And then finally, uh, after that all that entire process, which takes about four and a half minutes, then Dragon will be ready to actually depart and push itself away and separate using its Draco thrusters. Yeah, and so Dragon's initial departure from station is a little different from any of the other docked vehicles like the Soyuz, because that relies on springs to push them away from the docking port. Uh, in this case, Dragon will actually execute those two short thruster firings to undock. That uses a combination of those 12 Draco engines around the base of the capsule, with the first breaking any stiction between Dragon and the docking port and the second slowly backing the spacecraft away and so we're expecting the call for undocking sequence to begin in the next few minutes and the crew aboard uh, they will be able to see those transitions so what will be happening here is the the flight computers uh, on the vehicle will issue themselves into a state when that command is issued and actually on the crew displays uh, on on every display they've got a prominent location that shows what the current states are they're also able to follow along uh, and see what the state of the vehicle is so that those are the displays that they've got pulled up on their screen right now that middle display actually has uh, the the cards that describe what they 
they can expect to see along with some inline telemetry that they're getting from the vehicle directly, uh, as well as their current positioning relative to the International Space Station. And then they've also got some views on the side that are uh, each of them in their, their respective displays that are showing a forward view of the spacecraft as well as the status of those uh, docking hooks. At this point, the umbilicals both still installed because uh, that command has not been issued. And the uh, vestibule should be pretty close to vacuum. Getting closer every second to that undocking command being sent. We're looking for that in about five minutes from now. Taking a look at data here, I see the vestibule is reading as a 0.1 PSI. Um, so definitely not very friendly to humans. <laughs> Everything moving smoothly throughout the day to bring us to this point with uh, the crew ingressing Dragon, donning their suits, getting in their seats, closing the hatch, and then uh, Chris Cassidy closing the A-pass hatch on the station side, along with that node two forward hatch, bringing that space down to as close to a vacuum as possible, and that's where we're at right now. Uh, conducted some leak checks to ensure the seals between those hatches were solid. Everything looking good for an on-time departure today. Pretty comfy in the cabin right now. Um, you know, that vestibule is pretty near vacuum, but in the cabin, it's actually pretty close to what we would see at sea level and uh, still about 76 degrees in there. So pretty comfortable. Of course, Bob and Doug uh, are only partially seeing that. Earlier, they closed down their visors. Um, and so the, the suits that they're wearing protect them in the event of a depressurization event. They also protect them uh, if there were, was a fire on board. It's made of fire resistant materials. And so as we're getting to this critical step of separating from the space station, um, if something were to go wrong here, those suits would provide that critical uh, life support to them, pressurizing if the cabin pressure were to unexpectedly drop. It's actually part of the reason why we've spent so long in this uh, vestibule depressurization. The operators, both on the space station side and the mission control uh, Hawthorne side, uh, scrutinizing the data for any indication of a leak through the Ford hatch. Um, of course, that, that leak check performed earlier uh, with no findings um, showing the, the vehicle is nominal and ready for, for undocking. And as once we mentioned, that undocking uh, will take a few minutes before we actually see the separation occur. Um, but once the, um, the command is sent, those 12 latches will be retracted. Uh, the umbilical will be disconnected. Dragon is already on internal power, however. Um, it's not receiving any power from the International Space Station. But uh, once that umbilical is retracted, those hooks are removed. Be looking for those two short bursts to send Dragon on its way, and then things will Things will speed up with those uh, departure burns afterward. Just a couple of minutes away from that on time undocking. That'll be 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 11.30 p.m. GMT, or the time that the astronauts use aboard the International Space Station.
Looking for the undocking command to be sent in just about 30 seconds. And again, a quick, quick preview of what we expect to happen. Uh, umbilicals will retract, then we'll see those docking hooks uh, disconnect, and then we'll actually see those undocking burns followed pretty shortly after by a departure burn. Dragon SpaceX, undock sequence commanded. Pepper copies. So that undocking sequence right on time. And that was 4.30 p.m. Pacific time, 11.30 p.m. GMT. The umbilical now retracting. The International Space Station flying 263 statute miles over Namibia in Africa. Dragon SpaceX, umbilical D-mate complete and nominal. There's confirmation of the umbilicals retracted. So no longer receiving power or data or commanding from the International Space Station. And uh, there's a view on your screen of Dragon currently in eclipse. Uh, Gary, how's it looking from Mission Control at Johnson? We're looking good, Shiva. We have uh, we are now inside the undocking sequence. Good umbilical retraction. Standing by for the driving of those hooks. There's 12 hooks that will be released in two gangs of six. Standing by for the driving of the hooks. Here we have good motion on the primary set of hooks. Again, first set of hooks driving the navigation light, the forward end of Dragon clearly visible from this view from one of the uh, Japanese cameras. Again, we are inside of the undocking sequence now. Good umbilical retraction, and we're driving the first set of hooks. Dragon SpaceX, first set of hooks open and nominal. Copy nominal hooks in the first set. The first six hooks have completed their driving first set down. The second set is now driving. We're now committed to undock. Seeing good motion on that second set of hooks. Continuing to drive. These will be the final set of hooks. There's six of them holding Dragon into place now. Afterwards, we'll conduct two undocking burns to physically separate Dragon.
Dragon SpaceX, all Typical hooks separation. open and nominal. All hooks open. Dragon departing. Dragon SpaceX, separation confirmed. Separation. Great Burns, physical separation, 4.35 p.m. Pacific. Thrusters looking good. Counting down to a nominal departure burn zero coming up shortly. Dragon SpaceX, depart burn zero complete. Copy complete, we're advisors up. And you heard, depart burn zero complete, that 12 second firing moving Dragon slightly faster away from the International Space Station using those service section Dracos. And with that, Bob and Doug have concluded their stay aboard the International Space Station. They're on their way back to planet Earth. Confirms a physical separation at 4.35 p.m. Pacific as the station and Dragon were flying 267 statue miles over Johannesburg, South Africa. Two good undocking burns and a nominal departure burn zero. Next departure burn coming up in about five minutes. We'll be monitoring crew Dragon throughout the departure sequence, but with Dragon flying free, that'll do it from us here in Mission Control Houston. Godspeed. Bob and Doug, to take you through the rest of the departure sequence, we'll send you back over to Hawthorne. Thanks, Gary. Departure Burn Zero sets tr Crew Dragon, Endeavour, and Bob and Doug on their journey home. Dragon Ship Endeavour is now on a trajectory to head up and over the station before additional maneuvers will change its orbital path to take it below and in front of the station. Dragon will autonomously accomplish that through three additional departure burns, with that next one coming up in just a couple of minutes to get Bob Hurley, uh, Bob Vankin and Doug Hurley well away from the space station and on their way home. Beautiful view, uh, just had a beautiful view there of the relative navigation center, sensors uh, providing an infrared view of the International Space Station as Bob and Doug drift away from it. And uh, of course, as they are drifting away, going into that slightly higher orbit, uh, just because of balancing the force of gravity along with their centripetal acceleration, they will move a little bit slower than the space station. And so we'll expect Space Station to sort of drift ahead, and then as they conduct those additional burns, getting out of the approach ellipsoid uh, and the keep out sphere, then uh, they will come back down below sta Space Station with their apogee being about 10 kilometers below Space Station and, and slowly reducing their perigee. Next up in just a couple of minutes, uh, scheduled for 4.40 p.m. Or Pacific time and 11.40 p.m. GMT it will be depart burn one. That's a 20 second burn to further increase the opening rate between Crew Dragon and the International Space Station. Yeah, and uh, that view, the, what we just previously had, and you can actually see it on the, the right-hand screen of, uh, of Bob's display, is a relative navigation sensor that's providing an, an infrared view from the forward hatch of Dragon, uh, looking back towards the, the forward uh, module of the International Space Station. So that's where Dragon has been for the last 63 days. Uh, coming up in less than a minute is departure burn number one. Burn coming just about five minutes after separation. And uh, this is going to increase that opening rate between the space station and Dragon. And separation occurred on time today, as with everything else occurring on schedule, sending Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley back toward Earth, back toward home. 
So very, very exciting moment. Um, we should expect to hear a call out here for departure burn number one. Uh, departure burn number one is pretty short. It only lasts about 21 seconds, but uh, it's the burn that's going to get us on our way up, out, and away um, through the keep out sphere and uh, through the approach ellipsoid. Again, the keep out sphere, um, about 200 meter sphere around the International Space Station, and the approach ellipsoid, uh, four by four by two kilometer ellipse. Uh, if you imagine two Central Parks in New York City next to each other, uh, that's about how big that is. Just uh, guidance references for visiting vehicles. And we're seconds away now from departure burn one. These are autonomous burns. Uh, Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley are not pushing any buttons to make this happen. Uh, these are programmed into Dragon, and uh, we will be looking for that in just a few seconds from now. That's a view from the space station. Those two lights, um, the, the green light is the view that on the right-hand side of the Dragon vehicle. Uh, that would be the side that Bob Benkin was sitting on, and the red light, the side that Doug Hurley was sitting on. Uh, it's actually made pretty, pretty quick work getting away from the station. Going to look up some data, see if I can get the actual distance to station right now. And departure burn one has begun, that 20-second burn. This will also take it outside of the keep out sphere and outside of the approach ellipsoid and after complete. Dragon SpaceX, depart burn one complete. Nominal burn, you are go to doff your suits per procedure, 4.012. Reminder that the ground will be deactivating the big loop following exit from the approach ellipsoid, which is approximately 12 to 14 minutes from now. Okay. We Endeavor on the big loop. Go ahead, Endeavor. Chris, we just uh, can't thank you enough. It's been an honor and a privilege to be part of Expedition 63 with you, Anatoly, and Avon. It's been a great two months, and we appreciate uh, all you've done as a crew to help us uh, prove out Dragon on its uh, maiden flight. I'd also like to thank uh, Zeb and his team in Mission Control in Houston for the incredible amount of work they did to uh, make the dock to ops successful for Dragon, and also the teams at SpaceX that uh, keep us going towards the end of our mission that we look forward to splashdown tomorrow. I'd also like to wish you a, a great success on the rest of your expedition and a safe flight home in the fall. Take care, Fred. Endeavor Thank State you, Chris. State. State. Thank you, Anatoly. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Houston, and thank you, SpaceX. Endeavor Station, uh, Bob and Doug. Uh, wholeheartedly agree with those, those sentiments. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been an honor to serve with you. Safe travels and have a successful landing. Endeavor's a great ship. Godspeed. Endeavor copies all. Thanks, Chris. And we just heard some kind words exchanged between Crew Dragon Endeavor with Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley now on their way home. ISS and Dragon on the big loop. Endeavor has exited the keep out sphere. See you guys when you're back home. Benkin and Hurley leaving behind three people aboard the International Space Station that will return this October. That's Station Commander Chris Cassidy, Anatoly Ivanishin, and Yvonne Wagner of Roscosmos. So you just heard they exited the keep-out sphere. That's an imaginary sphere, 200 meters in diameter, uh, and that is around the space station. So it's one of the several safety zones set up to govern any visiting spacecraft either arriving or departing the station. Uh, before moving into the keep-out sphere, spacecraft have to be configured where they would not cross that boundary for at least four orbits, even if, as we mentioned, the spacecraft were to, for some reason, lose all of its maneuvering capabilities. Yeah, and that, uh, that capability, um, really what we're looking to hear is that the spacecraft is what's uncalled, called on what's a, uh, 
I am having such a hard time saying that. You'll get there. It's on a 24-hour safe, free drift trajectory. And that's what the call that we're hoping to hear from. So exactly as you mentioned, Leah, if we were to completely lose commanding authority over the spacecraft, we would want to make sure that we wouldn't potentially re-interact with the International Space Station in an uncontrolled way. And so these burns helping us to get out and away from the space station in a way that we could, if something were to go catastrophically wrong on the vehicle, protect the crew aboard the space station, of course, the crew aboard the spacecraft uh, until you were able to recover. Of course, Dragon spacecraft has been really rock solid this entire mission and has a lot of redundancy into it. So that scenario is pretty unlikely, but it's a good safety standard that we design all of our spacecraft to. And this, uh, this departure burn zero and one, as we mentioned, is bringing Dragon up and over the International Space Station. It's not just making a straight journey home. Uh, that will be determined later once the phasing burn is complete and then the deorbit burn, burn, which commits us to leaving space, to, to bringing Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley back into Earth. Uh, the hey, next... Thanks, Dragon on Dragon to Ground comm check with the cabin mic. I hear you loud and clear on Dragon to Ground. How me? Loud and clear, Anna. As we heard, they are now testing out the cabin mic, so they may be beginning to uh, doff their suits, take off their suits, which is uh, allowed now that the first two departure burns have been completed. And the next is scheduled for 5.27 p.m. Pacific time. That'll be uh, depart burn two, and that'll be 12.27 a.m. GMT. So it's really the middle of the night for the space station crew right now, and they'll be getting ready to go to sleep pretty soon. But our astronauts are awake for several months more hours before they get their sleep period later. Of course, they all got a chance to, to take a quick sleep shifting nap to be alert and awake um, for these operations. And, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, the, the crew are in the middle of doffing or getting out of their suits. That was a pretty dynamic period of time around the station, um, a time where there could have been a potential depressurization or if there were any problems with the thruster, we would want the crew suited. Of course, with that big burn out of the way and Dragon now on a confirmed trajectory away from the station, space station on its way out um, close to exiting the approach ellipsoid. Bob and Doug can get out of those spacesuits and get into something a little bit more comfortable. Um, and that, that test step of verifying the cabin mic, um, the spacesuits actually have uh, two microphones in them uh, just towards the, uh, near the jaw, actually in the, the base of the helmet. And so with Bob and Doug removing those spacesuits, they're testing their, their cabin mic just to make sure that they still have good communications with the, the crew operations responsible engineer here in Hawthorne. So we should expect um, a few more calls here as a dragon moves away from the approach ellipsoid. Um, we heard a couple of calls from the Capcom as well about deactivating the, the big loop, so to speak, and transitioning to dragon to ground. Uh, the big loop is a, is a comm network that connects flight controllers and mission control Houston, the International Space Station crew, uh, visiting vehicles, and uh, of course, like our mission control team here in Hawthorne, all together on one comm loop so we can all communicate with one another uh, if anything needs immediate attention. Uh, as we step out of integrated operations or joint operations with the International Space Station, we'll transition into mission control here in Hawthorne, having mission authority and transition all of those calls to uh, the Dragon to Ground loop. Yeah, so life on Space Station is kind of back to normal now that Dragon has departed and uh, they are still monitoring the departure, the, the crew on board uh, Crew Dragon is specifically. Uh, and I can imagine that the astronauts aboard the Space Station might be looking out and getting a final last view of Dragon before it returns to Earth. Uh, maybe in those bay windows, that cupola, that cupola window we have on the International Space Station. Uh, now, as we mentioned, Dragon is outside the keep-out sphere, and it is a little more than 500 meters away from the International Space Station. So we'll be looking for it to exit the approach ellipsoid coming up here in about six minutes. Yeah, right now, Dragon moving away um, just under one meter per second, um, or uh, close to like three feet per second uh, away from the space station. And uh, as it as it really starts to get further and further away, that speed will pick up a little bit until we get into, uh, into an orbit where uh, eventually we will have our highest point of our orbit, orbit be about 10 kilometers below the space station. And uh, coming up after that approach ellipsoid, 
uh, exit. They'll also have um, three more burns scheduled for today, so two more departure burns as well as a uh, departure phasing burn. And then uh, that should button up the activities, major activities for today, and Bob and Doug will hopefully be able to get some rest before a pretty exciting day tomorrow. Yes, I can imagine they are very excited. And tomorrow they can, uh, they'll wake up and then several more milestones to look forward to, including, as we mentioned, that deorbit burn, that final commitment to bringing them home. Uh, because if there were a change in potentially the weather over the next several hours, we would still be able to have Bob and Bob Bingen and Doug Hurley in Earth's orbit, uh, and they have enough crew supplies on board that they could stay there until a couple of days. That way we would have an opportunity for the weather to clear or for us to find a, another splashdown site. But everything's looking good for us to come home uh, to Pensacola tomorrow. Right now on your screen, views of Mission Control uh, on the right-hand side. This team is Mission Control in, in Houston. Uh, and on the left-hand side of your screen is Mission Control in Hawthorne. Currently still in joint operations as we're still in the approach ellipsoid. And uh, as we transition out of that four kilometer by, by two by two kilometer ellipse, uh, we will transition mission authority to the mission director here in Hawthorne. Um, while we've been in integrated operations and while we've been attached to the space station, uh, any commands, any uh, operations that we wanted to do on the Dragon spacecraft, of course, we're getting permission from the flight director in uh, Houston to conduct those commands because uh, the, the flight control team in Houston really responsible for the health and safety of the crew aboard the International Space Station as well as the uh, safety and performance of the International Space Station. It's kind of kind of wild to think about it. Sometimes we think I think about the International Space Station as a destination, but it's really a spaceship. Um, and you, in fact, earlier this, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, the space station had yawed completely around um, by adjusting its orbit, and so it was flying backwards, so to speak. Um, so it's a it's a spacecraft just like Dragon, just bigger. Oh, definitely a spacecraft. It's actually an orbiting laboratory. And so while they were on board, we talked about some of the science that uh, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley conducted. Uh, and while they were there, they completed 114 hours approximately wow. of scientific research aboard the International Space Station. And it's really amazing how much of that benefits life on Earth. Um, the space station obviously is in microgravity, and that gives us an opportunity to test things and, and to look a little closer at phenomenon that we can't when we're here on Earth. And so so uh, the International Space Station has provided countless medical advances and uh, technological advances for us over these past 20 years. And as we mentioned earlier, this is the 20th anniversary of the International Space Station this year. And so it's a big milestone. Uh, we'll be celebrating that later in November. And uh, that means there have been people living in space continuously for 20 years. So that's quite a feat. I love that it's international. I love that this is just such a good example of how when we work together, we accomplished something that at one time no one could have ever dreamed of. Yeah, just reading uh, some of the, the books by former crew members, I know they like to talk about the food aboard the space station and the sort of the international cultural events that they do between crews. They really consider themselves a big family and those kind words that we heard between Bob Doug and, and the station crew as leaving sort of shows just how close they became over just a short period of time, um, just a couple of months. Of course, uh, I'm sure they all knew each other pretty well from training in uh, Houston. Yeah, but something about being there with a common goal, um, and, and those are your family when you're there, you know. And so, of course, our astronauts get the opportunity to speak with their family uh, pretty regularly because we want them to, to not get too homesick. Um, of course, they get a pretty good view in exchange. But... Um, but yes, so we actually are coming up very shortly now. It looks like about a minute until we exit that approach ellipsoid and joint operations end between Mission Control Houston and Mission Control Hawthorne, which is just right behind us. 